It's time to get weird. What's the time? It's time to get weird. I said, what's the time? It's time to get weird. You'd think I don't need to ask a third time, but I do. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the time the first two I times. Just look it up in your text. Oh, wait. Oh, you know what? That's a good point. I, I've, I've got a clock on my phone. Never mind, I have an app. It's called <laughs> the clock app. All right, two seconds, gang. Yeah. Um, but, 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 there really has been no different opinions on Donald Trump in 30 years. Right? Yeah. Like, he's still, like, even now, in a more prescient context, all the same opinions about Donald Trump are the same, right? Well, the, the thing about Donald Trump that I think gets kind of forgotten to an extent is... We're used to the idea when some public figure says something stupid that that when we get upset or whatever, we can go to their boss, yeah. their bosses. And, and the only closest he has is NBC. And NBC's like, there's no more apprentice. Well, doesn't shut him up. You know, it's still Donald Trump. He's still really rich. And so when you're really, really, really rich and you don't care, you don't care, you know. Boy, ain't that the truth. Uh, I mean, the the question for me is the only unanswered question about Donald Trump is whether or not he will care to get his campaign paid off because he has enough momentum, but high enough unfavorabilities uh, in polling that the natural move for him would be to continue to build as much as you can in the early game, maybe win Iowa. You're not going to win New Hampshire uh, and then do whatever you can by Super Tuesday and then get one of the front runners to pay off all the money you spent on the campaign and cash out. If he were a normal candidate having this kind of experience, that is what he would probably do. But he's not. And literally anything he says doesn't have gravity. No other candidate would have survived calling, you know, John McCain less of a war hero because he got caught, you know, yeah. um, let alone, uh, you know, being, you know, getting into open warfare with a female news anchor. So he's, he's, he's something that we have not seen before in politics, but there is still money. Whether or not he will cash out to me is the big thing because when everybody talks about him going independent, uh, He's the one thing that we do know about Donald Trump is that he wants to come out ahead on the deal. That yeah. is his thing. And if he wants to come out ahead on the deal, he can't run independent because that's a money hole. Yeah, I, I, there are a lot of different sort of ways that like the nomination works. And, I don't see him ever getting the nomination for the Republican Party. No. I mean, it just even, won't happen. And so, you know, is there, if he gets enough momentum, is there some sort of deal the GOP strikes or whatever to say, well, this is why you're not going to get it and whatever? Independent, I mean, for him it's about brand. You know, if he says, well, I'll spend half a million and then my brand will be in this place, then I'll, I'll capitalize on it via X, I don't know. But, I mean, that's the thing, is that, like, it is a multi-million dollar enterprise to run a nation. Because if you're going to run independent, you're running nationwide. You know, unless you're just... Sorry, does it look like I'm... Okay, it's better now, but for a second I was, like, in a 90s video. I, everything was 10 frames per second. I mean, uh, I, I, you're good, good by me. I always Which 90s like video, video were you thinking 90s about? videos. Take on me. Early 80s video. The 80s, right? Yeah. Well, late 80s. It was uh, 88. 
Take on Aha. Uh-huh. I think that's got to be, I want to say earlier, because I think that was like, mm-hmm. Feudal Kill was 1983. You, uh, I know that I lived in Norway, and European Countdown, their top 100 video on New Year's Eve 1998, uh, or sorry, 1988, and uh, I know that Sledgehammer took second place, the first place was Aha, uh, but I might be wrong. How did the original you feel take about on that? me was recorded in 1984 and took three leaves to chart, reached number two. The video won six awards and was nominated for other awards in 1986 MTV Music Video Awards. It was recorded in 84 and then again in 85. Right. But the video was 86. Late 80s. Well, I mean, the technically video came out in 1985, but I'm not going to argue. Well, no, no, no. I'm, I'm talking about when it won, like, uh, uh, whatever. The first when his video thing was. They should be the entire podcast. Is us just arguing about when Aha came out with Take On Me. The video I mean, was 1985. That's all. I'm just saying. It was 1985 the video came out. It's great. Uh, Everyone will love it. Take On Me. I just made a mixtape and it was on there and I had to find out what year Take On Me <laughs> came out, guys. All right? That is why I know this is because I had to pick a song for each year of the 80s and I was con- trying to figure out, get to the bottom of the whole ta- Aha thing because it was recorded twice. Can you give us the mixtape? What's that? Can you tell us what the mixtape is? Like, like what was on the mixtape? And it just sound lame, so no. Come on. I mean. Come on. Shouldn't. Shouldn't. You heard one of them, so there you go. Anyhow, boring conversation. Oh, I thought that was the fun conversation. And, and anyway, let's talk more about 80s music. They would love socialist 80s past. music curated by Andrew May. Brian's socialist past. My socialist past? Oh, I, I, are we calling into question my patriotism? I don't know. Hans, tell us more. Ah, it's Sven. Fuck you. No, sorry. Uh, okay, man, we are uh, we're ready to go. Let me let me set levels real quick. Uh, Justin, let me hear your voice. My name is Justin. I'm talking on the Weird Things podcast. What about you, Andrew? I'm Andrew Maine, and I'm American to Sharon, and I'm not going to apologize for it. It's hot. It's the mm. surface of the sun out there. Mm. Mm. Dude, yeah, California boiling right now. Boiled? Yeah. Boiled! Damn! 99 degrees outside. Excessive heat warning. Let me, let me do a... How, how, how hot is it? Outside my door, like 99. Mm, that's, that's hot. It's only 95 here. Yeah, but you're from Texas. <laughs> it's like you—you you deserved it. You, you scorp- went there of your own accord. Scorpion is a mare. You know what? Oh, look at that humidity. Look at the humidity there. Scorpion is a mare. Yeah, thirty-one percent. One third of the air I'm breathing breathing is water. One. It's seventeen percent here. Mm. Mm. Wait, are we like really? Yeah, dude, we're whipping Inter- out our weather about mix. how hot it is. Yeah, we we totally yes. are. <laughs> Who, it's welcome, summer, welcome it's to the Weather Wiener podcast. Uh, hang on, Neshcom is pointing out. That Shut up, Justin. 81 degrees in Oakland. Just <laughs> hot as hell out here, man. <laughs> Shut your mouth. Shut your mouth. Uh, <laughs> really? Are you idiots really complaining about the weather? You guys really? <laughs> it's 84 degrees here. That's amazing. Uh, hang on one second. I mean, listen, I'm just going to say, while I was out at brunch, it was it was a steamy, sweaty affair. Oh, poor thing. Brunch. I know. Hey, listen. If I won't suffer for the people, then who will? Um, sorry, I'm trying real hard to figure out. To be the shepherd. Yeah. So, how, how Brian, uh, do you have anything early tomorrow? No, 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 no. Um, I, I, I've got, um, uh, it sounds like it'll be the end of the world if I don't watch uh, Mr. Robot, uh, like four episodes of it between now and tomorrow. So but you can do that before it. I land. Uh, sure. I mean, unfortunately. You can like roll right into some hearth and oats. Late oh, night, Christ. Monday morning hearth and oats. Wait, do you mean actual morning morning, or do you mean like after midnight Sunday night? After midnight, we're going to let it all hang out. I'm going to play Hoth and Oats. Uh, 
Okay, so you mean tonight, tonight. <laughs> tonight, tonight, like the Smashing Pumpkin song. Yeah. Released right. in 1998? Uh, gentlemen, I'm ready to go when you are. Someone tell me if I'm right. It's 1997. Five. Oops. <laughs> Five, four, three, two. Welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Maine. I've been a little bit absent lately. I have a good excuse. Joined by Brian Brushwood. Yeah, by absent, you mean you got kidnapped by those aliens who turned you into a Sasquatch monster, and then you had to replace all your Sasquatch parts with robot parts, and then only after you were fully roboticized were you able to synthesize DNA of a human being, make yourself into a recombinant human, teleport yourself back into the past, and show up just in time for this week's episode. I did keep some Sasquatch parts. And Justin Robert Young. <laughs> Tell him, Bry. <laughs> Holy cow, it's so good to have you back. There's nothing like you being away for two hours for us to realize how necessary you are to the Weird Things podcast. Thank you, Andrew. You're the best. I'm glad you understand that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, lesson Jumbo has beans. been taught. Um, first, uh, quick question. Um, which podcast do we want to geek out about all the Star Wars news? Into this one? <sighs> yeah, no, let, I, let's just jump straight into this one. I mean, I mean, it's on the forefront of all of I our mean, minds. I mean, this is, all right. So uh, when we did the Mad Max podcast, there were some people that were like, hey, geeking out about a movie is not weird news. And you have to understand that this is indeed the Weird Things podcast, and we talk about weird things within our purview, but this is really a story of me, Brian, and Andrew hanging out. And if there is something that is headline news for all of us, we are going to talk about it. And I do believe that what was revealed at the D23 event this weekend in regards to Star Wars is in that field. So, Andrew, go ahead. Brian, are you on board of this? Yeah, 100%. 100%. So... D23, that's the big official Disney convention, of which I couldn't go to because of uh, I was at the Jareth Masquerade thing and some other stuff. Um, we had some revelations. We had some uh, new updates. We had some confirmation of some rumors and maybe some stuff we'd heard internally, whatever, couldn't talk, couldn't talk about. But here's what we know now. One, we got a kick-ass photo for our Star Wars Rogue One, which is the anthology series. For the one person out who does not know, what Disney's going to do is we're going to get a Star Wars film that's Episode 7 coming up this December. Then the next film is going to be one that won't be an 8. It'll be a thing called Star Wars Rogue One, which is sort of within the Star Wars universe and actually takes place before the first Star Wars A New Hope, as it was retroactively called. Then we get Star Wars... Uh, we get seven, we get eight, and then we get nine, and then we're going to get between those other Star Wars films. So we got our first cast photo from well, this, do, and this is get, the... Uh, uh, is, is the Han Solo movie in between seven and eight? I seven, believe eight. it's between eight and nine. Eight and nine, okay. And so, oh, okay, yeah, yeah the, 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 the Josh Trank uh, rumored Boba Fett movie Phil, was supposed now to the be Phil, after the Lord, Phil Lord and uh, the... Uh, So what comes next is we get episode seven directed by yeah. J.J. Abrams. Mm -hmm. Then we get Rogue One directed by Gareth Edwards, who did Godzilla and Godzilla. Monsters. All right. And they show us the first photo of this. So this takes place right. These, this is the mission that stole the plans for the Death Star. So it probably ends with somebody handing them off to Princess Leia or whatever. But this is the team, the ragtag team of bounty hunters that went after that. And if you look at the photo... It's kind of cool because it looks like they're actually on Yavin, which was the rebel base in Star Wars. Which uh, which photo is it? I don't Go know. Go to StarWars.com. Yep. Your source for all your official Star Wars news. And you will see a link that says... There we go. That, that, that's one. the photo right there, the Rogue One photo. Wait, they're able to intuit that this is uh, Yavin from this photo? I intuited that it's Yavin from that photo. Well, okay, first of all, I don't doubt you. You're the asshole who recognized everything, and spoiler alert, you figured out, like, 
just looking at the teaserest of teaser <laughs> freaking trailers for a for a, a, a super a, eight. Super eight. That's what it was. You call up the cinematographer, and the first words out of your mouth are like, "So he's in the water tower, huh?" And then he's like, "What are you talking about?" And of course, you're right. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I could be wrong, but it, it looks, you got, you got an old stone structure, you got weeds and stuff, it's the right time frame and all that, so it makes sense that, you know, if you want to tie it into that, that that would be, you know, it's not, not that, I'm not, I don't care, I mean, it sounds cool, I'm into it and all that, you know, I'm not one of these people, like, oh, they got the cape wrong, they ruined it, you know, I hate those fans, yeah. sure. I hate them. I hate them, hate them, hate them. But, but, but what's important about factor. this photo is that it looks... Uh, Grim for a reason, you know. I think when people get upset about like the the quote unquote dark gritty reboot problem, it is when otherwise happy situations are made dark unnecessarily. Fantastic Four, Superman, stuff like that. This looks like a bunch of people who are about to go on a suicide mission because it's a movie about a bunch of people who are about to go on a suicide mission. Yep, it's. So Gareth Edwards, who I think is a very capable director, the cinematographer is the guy that uh, did, uh, was it like, I think, uh, what was the last one he did? He's done a lot of really gritty, uh, a lot of gritty films. Um, I think Zero Dark Thirty. And I think he, did he do cinematographer? Let me, I should know this off the top of my head. Um, well, Zero Brian, Dark Thirty. Uh, well, well, while Andrew's looking that up, Brian, what are your first thoughts on this? Uh, man, it's it's tough for me to want to invest myself in in speculation on this at all. Um, uh, ma mainly just because I've been I've been very deeply burned, and I understand this is my fault. It's not Disney's fault, uh, but uh, but just I played this game. I played this game of fantasizing and wishing and hoping, and I got burned not once, twice, but thrice. And so it's tough for me to invest myself. Plus. I You're actually talking, have you enjoyed mean, the Star Wars universe. I have enjoyed. Uh, well, I, I, I'm talking about. I'm guarded. I'm guarded forever. Uh, and and understand, it's not just from the pre prequels. The prequels was three times investing myself emotionally and then feeling burned. But um, but I really gave myself full force to the uh, expanded universe. I truly gave my heart to it, and I loved it. And. And then was told that none of that counts and it's all lies. And and uh, so I, I don't know. But, but I think that second part is what is important about what we're seeing with Rogue One. Because number one, it, it is lower stakes. Like, it's not like Han Solo is going to show up and start playing yo-yo. And then we're going to have to pretend like Han Solo always loved yo-yo throughout the you know original trilogy or something like that. Where they're just uh, like retconning gigantic pieces of our childhood. Right. This is an expanded universe story made into a movie, which again, yes, I, I I'm I'm totally down for. But it's like, um, uh, I, I I I've been burned on both sides. I've been burned on official canon, the prequels, sucking and being like, no, you have to understand, this is the real story. And I've been burned by actually liking stuff that in the expanded universe, and then being told after the fact, oh yeah, by the way, stop loving that. It doesn't count. So it's well, like, okay, what well, well, first. I, you know, I, I, I'll give you a gimme on like we all wanted the, we all hoped Phantom Menace was going to be great, and then ten minutes in, you know, some of us realized this is a disaster. Everything we feared, everything we feared that we'd heard was true and even worse than we could have thought. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, the expanded universe stuff, like I never, I loved that stuff, but I was never wedded to it because like I loved Heir to the Empire. I also loved Dark Horse's Dark Empire. Both of them weren't true. Both of them could not be real. Both of them could, Star Wars could not accommodate both of those stories. And there's been a lot of expanded universe stuff that just contradicted each other. And so I never took it as, and, and canon is sort of a weird word that means that we want to believe that it's real and we want someone to tell us what's real. When well, I mean, and, and it really is us asking mom and dad who's right in the argument. Right. Because we might love different things and we ask mom and dad, no, but who's real? Who's right? Who's canon? You know, like, I mean, like, I guess like for me, the the big and it well, is clearer now that Star Wars and Marvel are both under Disney because Marvel, we understand different writers write for these different characters all the time. Sometimes Aunt May is dead. Sometimes Aunt May is a cyborg. Some I said cyborg. Cyborg. Like, like no, it's fine. Robot. She, she's a cyberman uh, on yeah. Doctor Who. 
So, so, so sometimes, Peter Park, like Park, Peter Parker's a clone for ten years. Exactly, and, and and things get rewritten over and over and over and over and over and over again. Uh, and sometimes there are hard reboots, like what Marvel and DC have done in the last five years, where they've just said, "Yeah, you want to know what?" And we're done with that story. We begin with a new story right now. So the idea that we are just getting a now totally cohesive, top-down story to me. For fans of canon, for fans of connective story, this is hugely great news that we are going to no, get okay, these stories. Really, people are actually going to give a rat's ass, and it's not just going to be a conversation of like, well, the rights are to this person. So, so here's the thing. Um, when somebody like me in my position says, I don't know, I'm guarded, I hope it'll be good, whatever. You're wrong not to unconditionally love it, Brian, you're wrong! <laughs> well, and that's just it, right, is is essentially what I'm doing is I'm flinching. And when a dog flinches, when you act like you're going to punch it, that's because that dog has experienced pain and it regrets trusting unconditionally. Uh, I Twice, twice I've trusted unconditionally. I invested, I mean, you're talking to a guy who's read 20 expanded universe novels and then it was it was a significantly painful thing to be told yes please actively forget all of those they don't count and it was also significantly painful for me to wait all night you know for uh, for the prequels one two three at a time and be told that okay these count but the better stories don't what was the first expanded universe thing you read uh air air no 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 um it was Heir to the Empire. Then I read uh, Tales from Jabba's Palace, which was extraordinary. You had all these science fiction authors. Right. Take a crack at, uh, Tales from the Cantina, Tales of the Bounty Hunters. Can, uh, I, can I tell you my first expanded universe story? Sure, sure. Yeah, please. Splinter of the Mind's God Eye. God damn it. No, that doesn't count. That was dumb. That was a bad <laughs> book, and you should feel bad for having read it. I was 10, Brian. Okay, I fine. Was 10. There was a time... You, there was this great period of which Heir to the Empire, which they had this big, huge publishing, and all of a sudden there are all these books out there in the Star Wars universe. Before that is a hungry, desperate Star Wars fan who lusted over a copy of Han Solo at Star's End that I saw at my friend's house, that I contemplated stealing it so I could read this thing that was out of print, okay? Splinter of the Mind's Eye, Alan Dean Foster. This was the book that Lucas authorized, authorized this book, gave his notes, whatever, takes place between Star Wars... Well, it doesn't place. It takes place between Star Wars and nothing because it ain't canon anymore. Sure, Luke and Leia yeah. have this big romance in there. A lot oh of stuff. Oh my happens. God, that's right. I forgot about that part. Yeah. And so I was used to the whole idea of like, no, no, that didn't happen. So let me and let's not forget the Marvel comics. I used to read the Star Wars Marvel comics, the Sunday comics, all that stuff. Or freaking Rabbit, or Rabbit in the Jet in the Rebels. The Rebel Rabbit, remember that guy? No, I don't. But that sounds oh, awesome. No, no, no. Yeah, no. There is there is a rabbit character. It's a Jack, that, uh, whatever. Star Wars Rabbit. Uh, well, here, uh, Brian. Let me let me ask you this: Is there a? Is it because? Jackson, sorry. In, sorry, say that again, Andrew Jackson. Jackson. J a x x o n. Is it because you love the franchise so that you feel that the idea that one, like. Like, the, wait, Jackson's the, from Planet Coachella Prime. Coachella? <laughs> I hear TV on the radio's headlining this year. At That's Coachella amazing. Prime. They're going to have a hologram of the Emperor showing up. Yeah. He's like, what's up, Coachella? <laughs> Hail Mary, come quick see. What do we have here now? Oh. Uh, I'll tell you, anybody who, who picked up a reference of the Empire rapping Tupac, uh, uh, write me at Justin Robert <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right. So uh, is it because you love Star Wars so much that you feel that it is a betrayal that they got rid of the canon of, of the expanded universe? Because this is a common thing. Like, like, like Marvel does it all the time. DC does it all the time. And, 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 and I, I'm with you. I understand your pain. But uh, just to illustrate it for, for the listener, like, where does that come from? Why I mean, is that's, it different? That's the weird part, it right? Is it, it, the simplest place for my head to be is, well, screw Star Wars. I'm out. I hate Star Wars because it screwed me over. That's a black and white simple thing. But the problem is I still deeply, deeply love the universe. I love the stories that it tells. I love the archetypes. I am currently in the middle, a uh, spoiler alert, when it comes to talking about picks later, we're going to talk, my pick, picks will be Rebels because I'm loving watching it with Penny. Um, however, 
I have to acknowledge that I have been seriously burned. I got burned, and it, there is what, genuine but, pain. What, what makes it different than than when comics do it? Like, I, I guess that that's my question because I know you're a huge comics fan. I know that you you have seen this revisionist uh, uh, history all the time, made yeah. by the powers that be. Like, what what makes it? unforgivable for, for Star Wars. Not, not unforgivable, right? Because like I know if it's good, you'll like it, right? right? But it's like, what makes it more painful? Or is it just that now it's slower with Star Wars than it is with comics? You know, um, number one, that's a really good question. Number two, I, I feel like if I was going to take a guess, I would say that uh, Star Wars has lost none of its ability to seduce me. What it has lost is my my... Uh, default position to be to it's all part of a plan. They've got it. They've got something that they're working out or whatever. And and I would say that comic books really never had that to begin with. I liked. I, I would say I loved co comic books, and so there were certainly arcs that I loved deeply. But comic books as a general genre was such a mixed bag that there was always like nutty stuff. You know, it's like you you know, do you love or do you hate the mis Mr. Fix It era of of the, the Incredible Hulk where he works as a bodyguard in Vegas or whatever. It's like, for me, I loved it. I, I thought that was a wonderful side journey because it was a weird, you know, antithesis of what the Hulk story had always been. The, the idea that Banner was the useless appendage on the other side of the Hulk uh, instead of the other way around. I thought it was great, you know, and uh, some people hated the Secret Wars because it was a naked grab for the ability to sell, sell toys, but I loved it because it, it distilled everything into archetypes and it, it was the exact same fantasy that we would play in second grade with all of the, the stuff. The, but the problem is, um, in the last 10 years, I, I would say, well, maybe 15. For 15 years, let me, let me flip it back on you. For 15 years, name one truly great thing that's come out of the Star Wars universe. Wait, in the last what? 15 years. Since, since the prequel, first prequel came out till now. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a couple of the video games, um, but, but keep in mind, like, the best video games, X-Wing versus TIE Fighters, uh, happened before then. Yeah, I, well, I mean, I think that's part of the reason why, Lucas, it was, a, it was a franchise that one guy who was bored with it was running it versus Marvel, which was a healthy thing, bringing in new talent and constantly well, revitalizing it. Again, that's why I am cautiously optimistic, but the emphasis is on cost, cautiously yeah. here. And and part of the reason I well, asked that I, question I, is because- Brian, you have made exactly the point. The point is regime change. That's what's different, is that the, the palaces have been cleaned out. There are new people that are in there that have a track record of success with this kind of stuff. And that you take whatever we love inherently, whatever is special about the Star Wars story and put it in capable hands and then give us little breadcrumbs. And by the way, we are in the weirdest phase of this right now. Which is why I, I honor and understand your pain and trepidation. Well, because I mean, they, I, like, like now, if things are good, then we'll be like, yeah, right, they're good now. They, these new people made good things. That's what's the difference. Uh, if they're bad, then we'll be like, yeah, people can get these things wrong. But right now we are just in this evidenceless position where we just say, all right, competent people with this stuff can't get it wrong. So can they? Let's, okay, real quick. I actually, I think we may have stumbled into a really interesting question. What is the best three things that have come out of the Star Wars universe in the last 15 years? Things that you cannot include are uh, Shadow of the Empire came out in the mid 90s. You can't 96. include the Timothy Zahn series, which was extraordinary, but also came out in the 90s. Um, you could, I would say, I would submit, here's my pick for the best Star Wars thing of the last 15 years is uh, Knights of the Old Republic, uh, uh, one and two. I would say especially one on the Xbox. Oh, that oh, was wait, extraordinary. Can I put out my best thing? Yeah. Rebels. Uh, yeah, you know what? You're right. Yeah, no, I'll give you that. Uh, Rebels is is really, really good. Uh, I'm, I'm falling in love with Zeb minute by minute. I love I love his character. And I my and I guess that that in Rebels, like there were some good Clone Wars stuff. There were some good Clone Wars episodes. There was you could tell there were people there that loved it, were very passionate about it. And then some guy walks into the room and says, you know, there's this political thing I think we should address. You know, let's do a three-part thing about how banks control, 
you know, funding to these things and da 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 da. And you're like, I wonder who that person was? I don't know. I just a guy, like an office guy, just yeah. like an office boy. Maybe just a woman. Some Maybe some random dude just came in and Sally said, "Sally like, the well, copy girl." You know, goes I in just there. really think that there's a lot of, that we need to understand about banks. <laughs> yeah, you know, and so you could tell that there were people there. Were, you know, you watch just any one episode of Clone Wars, and visually, you go, "This is." one of the most amazing things ever on television. And then you get some of those episodes, like the three arc stuff, when they did the rise of the bounty hunters and some of that other stuff, a lot of it was just too drawn out. But it was still, there was some great, great, great stuff in there. Now, for Rebels, you can tell they cut the budget back. You know, that the animation isn't anywhere nearly as complicated. There's a lot of things, the time frames and all that stuff. But the writing, that team, that group of people, the way they're pulled together, I thought it's very compelling. The humor, I mean, that, that so much of it is like, brothers beating up on each other kind of humor that i'm like man i'm i'm glad they do this but i could see people getting upset by the fact this little robot just knocked a kid off of the spaceship you know kind of thing and sure you know. sure oh no no no. i well i mean and we'll we'll talk more about rebels but i i will say i will say that enters my top three uh rebels i think definitely is top three from the last 15 years knights of the old republic uh i would say the full game uh, the Old Republic, the MMO, uh, man, did I want to love, but it didn't quite get there. So I'll, I'll put Knights of the Old Republic, the Xbox game. Is is there anything else that fits in that third slot? Uh, I mean, there were me, some novels uh, and stuff uh, that people it, loved. It, to me, Star Wars Celebration. Like, it, it is it is the idea of it as a, that the fans meant something. That the fans showed up and, and, and the, the collection and understanding that, for one property, they can draw the crowd that they do that led this to salvation. And if, if, if these are good, right, if, if, we, if, if the regime change worked, because that's the thing is, is Brian, for, for what you're saying, I have very little interest in, in picking apart the, the dying embers of uh, a, a creator's journey with his work of art, like and saying, hey, what was the best element of the the weakest uh, stretch of of, of 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 an idea, what I do have an interest in is looking forward, and I think what made with the kindling that made that fire that is right now building and will culminate with episode seven and everything else that comes afterward is the fact that people give a rat's ass and they want to see more of these characters treated with respect. Yeah, I guess. I mean, but uh, even as you're saying this, I'm realizing that, and, and we've talked about this on the show, I think that I have some core issues that cause me to be deeply attracted to interesting beginnings and not very good at uh, being fascinated by stewardship. And we're entering the stewardship phase of, uh, of, of uh, Star Wars. Whoever inherits it, it's their job to not screw it up. You know, like, like, uh, like I wouldn't... I oh, would... I, I totally disagree about that. Oh, really? Oh, I think like it is incumbent upon them to start a beginning. I think episode seven is their beginning. I mean, like, like they need to, like, like they need to set up. The reason why they have relied so heavily on on what is new about episode seven that they 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 have very. If you looked at how they've they've laid stuff out, it was Finn and uh, Lady. I forget her name right now. And BB Eight. Uh, and then they, they had the big trailer reveal of uh, Han and Chewie. And now we're hearing about Kylo Ren and, and where Kylo Ren comes from and that the Kylo Ren isn't his real name and all this stuff. They will begin with the new heroes. They will sandwich in your old favorites. And then they will end with the big bad, the, the, the thing that will take down our heroes because that's where they want you to be when the story begins. That means... That the beginning and end of what they want to talk about is the fact that this is a brand new story that is hopefully compelling and interesting about the Star Wars saga. And if they don't start this out good, if this is just fan service, then this is a declining franchise and I have less interest in it. Well, I, I think that the thing that gives me hope is that all of the rumors, like all the rumors leading up to episode one, you know, there was there was so many. There, the fear was Lucas hasn't directed a film since Star Wars. That was number one. That problem number two was, you know, Lucas doesn't listen to anybody anymore. That was another one, right? There was all the stuff leading into that where, you know, there's this like, oh, and we're like, yeah, but you know what? Maybe he's still got the magic. He's still got the brilliance. But then he'd be like, yeah, but, you know, he hates Empire the most. And that's the best, you know? And then he put more control over Jedi. 
and that's kind of half really good and half kind of meh. And then you're on the back of your head is this thing. And then we got the Ewok adventures. And then you got like, no, no, he's got it. He's got it. So we're just convincing ourselves that these things could really be good. How could a Star Wars movie be bad? Yeah. And then you get, you know, oh. the trailer comes out and you're like, okay, Darth Vader's a lot younger than we were thinking. You know, this is, uh, it's not going to be really interesting at that age, but uh, he's Lucas. He knows what he's doing. You know, you know, and then you're like, you're watching Phantom Menace. Like, first three minutes into Phantom Menace, I'm like, how can this be boring already? You know, like, oh, should we dock the ship and this? Well, let's go in there. And now they're, now they're in a goddamn conference room waiting, <laughs> you know? And then, ah, yes. Uh, and then you're like, wow, this feels a little bit. And then you're like, he's not listening to anybody, you know? And then and then after the movie comes out, it was like the, the, the thing that was giving us hope about the other ones. Like, yeah, but now he went to his movie making friends and said, hey, give me feedback on this. Give me that. And you hear about people were telling them, like, well, maybe this that's not a good sign. And so uh, I guess here, you know, the idea is that there are some very passionate, caring people that want to make this work. I hope that, you know, putting Kathleen Kennedy in there is a sign that they weren't going to leave it to a committee. Uh, Iger's the kind of guy, as you see, the steward his stewardship with Pixar and with Marvel is, you guys know what you're doing. I will tell you what we want. And if you can give us what we want, we're all going to get along great, you know. Maybe this one's going to be overdone, might have problems with it, whatever. Maybe it's going to kind of be flat and lifeless or whatever. They're going to get it right, you know. They're going to get it right eventually. I'm kind of almost a way more excited about Rogue One because it's like, hey, we just have to tell a story that ends here with characters you don't know anything about. That's exciting to me. And also, the the upside of not doing, you know, getting away from, you know, the expanded universe is that, you know, it, the movie's no longer a checklist, you know? It's not a, when's Mara Jade showing up? You know, when's Thrawn popping in? And I love those characters. Sure, sure. I love, love those characters, and I hope that they say, pluck people from there, you know, to use that. But, you know, it, it's, it's that checklist entertainment, which is a lot of the Marvel comics, you know, you look at threads where, you know, they got the costume wrong, or I didn't like this thing, and it's like, I was hell's the story. Okay, so I'll tell you what, how, how excited would you be? End of episode seven, you know, our heroes defeat whatever element of the First Order, you know, is coming at them. And now you see almost Joker-like in Batman Begins the, revel like the, the revelation that coming from another quadrant is the reinforcements led by Admiral Thrawn. You know, and like, like it gives them the freedom to do it without being forced or beholden to 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 that universe. I mean, to be honest, that's the one shred of hope that I have for this whole thing is like what if this is all part of their play of like hey guys, here's the team rule is we all loudly denounce anything from the expanding universe being canon and what that get, what that buys us that will be unpleasant for the next 4 years, but that what it buys us is anything we want to steal from the expanded universe will be universally beloved and praised. Or, or it's, it's, you know, it's Admiral Brushwood and he's has blue skin and he acts exactly like Admiral Thrawn, except sure. he doesn't have the same hangups and problems with the emperor and, you know, dealings with Mara Jade that we expect of Admiral Thrawn. So when we look at him, we're like, but wait, he doesn't have the following lieutenants on his bridge. This is bull. That's like, you know, I, you know, my fear is what my fear is. And, and I'm probably, I'm afraid that this is going to be real, is those that, like, the biggest problem right now in trying to do franchises is that we get incomplete first movies to launch them. Agreed. Because they're like, oh, we're going to tell a big story, so the first one's going to set up all these things, and you're not going to get any, you'll get, you'll get the, 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 the A plot is not going to be as important as the B plot. You get to the end of the A plot, and then there's the mustache trilling guy waiting in the bet wings, and da 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 and you're like, huh. All right, that was a problem with Prometheus for me. That was why I think Terminator Genesis was such a disappointment. I think that's why so many of these people, these attempts to try to launch these pre these these new franchises fail because they try to set up everything and lay down all this sort of groundwork. And you're like, yeah, but this movie doesn't stand on its own. Speaking of which, uh, I will just a quick tip of the hat. Uh, boy, oh boy, did I love the um, uh, the two book. Uh, 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 what, uh, it's not a trilogy. What do you call it when there's only two books? Duopoly? Uh, I'm two asking. books. Okay, anyway. The two books where um, uh, in the same universe as Grand Admiral Thrawn, uh, where essentially it's a heist con man movie where uh, you have one guy who knows the tactics of 
Thrawn. You have a alien that looks close enough to Thrawn. You have somebody who knows what Thrawn would say. And then the three of them together start the rumor that Thrawn's back in the game and that he's real and that, you know, you better get with the Empire real quick. Uh, it's it, highly recommended. Well, and I, that goes to show there, there's so much. I, I When they announced they're doing Star Wars anthologies and the idea that we were going to get Star Wars movies between seven and eight and all that, you know, my nerdgasm was huge because Star Wars is so much more interesting to me than Jedi's. Then, you know, ah, here's the lightsaber. Now you got to fight the Sith. It was so much bigger and better than all of that. And the idea that we can have these other kinds of stories, like we're going to get a heist movie, you know, and then we're going to get a young Han Solo movie, you know, which is awesome, you know, by the people that did the Lego movie, which I think is a I, great I choice. That That's what makes me really, really excited about it is that there were, you know, many times with Andrew driving between, you know, Arby's or Taco Bell <laughs> that we would talk about Star Wars movies and, and what would happen. And my point was always Star Wars should have the pick of Hollywood. Whoever is doing a thing, everybody loves Star Wars and everybody would drop their like drop everything to make sure and clear their schedule to be part of the Star Wars universe. And what we are seeing right now is a smart person's, at least from my perspective, because I like all these directors, uh, choice, the pick of the litter of people who are doing fun, interesting things uh, to come and be a part of this universe. And the sage wisdom that when they make a decision on one of them and then one of them starts building a tent on set and refusing to uh, interact with directors and telling his actors when to blink uh, and, and destroying his house to fire him before he starts production. Yeah, yeah. Can we, can, we, uh, can we talk a little bit? I assume uh, you're talking about Josh Trank, right? Can we talk about the unusualness of the, Josh, of, of the Trank situation? Sure. Uh, I mean, this was a Hollywood Reporter story. Uh, apparently, the gloves are off, and people are, like, talking to the press, uh, not with names so much, but uh, certainly going on record enough for people in, in reputable positions to print it that uh, Josh Trank was... All the rumors that we had heard about Josh Trank being a menace on set uh, was indeed true. Um, me, guys. Yeah. So I'm going to throw out something here, okay? Imagine... Imagine Bob Iger. We're right in the middle of the show. We get a, he skypes into the show. He's like, you guys talk about Star Wars better than anybody else I know. You guys are great. I want you guys to be the brain trust and directors of a new Star Wars film. It's all yours. Okay? Yeah. Um, can we I, complete control. We have complete control. Okay? <laughs> can, 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 can I, uh, you know, with uh, uh, hindsight being 2020, can I say to this fictional person, person um, uh, it's great that you recognize our passion. It's great that you understand that we're eloquent speakers. Uh, no, you no, got to no. understand. A Andrew, Andrew, you're you're Bob Iger. Okay. You are you are actually Bob Iger. Talk to Brian. Brian, hey. Andrew, Justin. You know, I like to bet on new talent, and I think you guys should do your own Star Wars film. Oh yeah, uh, right. I'm uh, so, well, so take it. No, no, uh, real quick, real quick, Justin. I, I, I just Bob Iger, just a little bit more. What do you mean by saying you know we should do a, a film? What do you mean? I got a hundred million dollar check. Who do I send it to? Okay. All right. Here's my pitch. I can walk it down to hey, Andrew right now. He's Andrew, in Burbank. It's just, down the road. Just, oh, oh, real All quick. Right, here, Justin. Listen. Dip. Uh, Justin. Just, just two meets, okay? The Cantina Band meets Last Tango in Paris. An erotic thriller, the likes of which we've never seen. Justin, please stop talking. Uh, Bob Iger, uh, real quick, uh, just on the business side of things, what are your expectations for this extraordinary check you're about to write us? What do you well, expect I, you know, us to This is to the deliver? most important franchise in all, you know, of all media. Uh -huh. um, and I think guys who talk as passionately about it as you and guys who just seem to have so much knowledge and wisdom about where this should go what could go wrong uh, wait, I, all right here we go salacious crumb meets a beautiful mind this is a blockbuster waiting Justin, to happen look we've already got uh, shh, uh, uh, i'm sorry bob Iger. uh real quick i just a couple things and and i know this is poor negotiation i probably shouldn't be sharing this with you but has it occurred to you that maybe because people love a thing and because people are able to talk maybe doesn't qualify them to direct a hundred million dollar budget film 
I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you over the sound of my pen on this humongous check. You were saying the squeaky part of the Sharpie. It's really like... All the bounty hunters that are gathered in Empire Strikes Back meet Spice World. So so jump forward two years, (laughs) and out comes Star Wars Anthology. What's the title of this? The title is uh, The Salacious Boner. (laughs) And it's it's just smash cut. Smash this cut is... to me and Justin in a boardroom together with my hands covering my face, shaking my head slowly. And, and I'm I'll... so excited. So... Finally, my vision made real. So Just... let's be clear on this, okay? <laughs> Two years later, Bob Iger probably doesn't have a job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we would all agree that that would go down and it's the dumbest decision ever. Yeah. Okay? Agreed. Here's my question. Are the three of us, are we to blame? I would say yes. <laughs> I, no. I, like, what's funny is I've already, in my mind, I've already watched the crappy, crappy movie that we made, and I'm it's ashamed. The worst <laughs> movie ever. It is the worst movie ever. Some people maybe stab their eyes out in the middle of it, okay? Oh, no. That's, a, that's, that's good PR. <laughs> Uh, no, no, no. I, I think, I think Andrew's, Andrew's totally correct. The, the problem with Fantastic Four is that Josh Trank, uh, bless his heart, wanted to make a Cronenberg-esque body horror movie with the Fantastic Four franchise. And that is a problem that exists on a fundamental level because that's not the Fantastic Four movie that A, is going to be good, or B, is going to make money. And and whatever has happened past somebody made the decision to write that check and let him hire actors and start shooting for that idea is up to the studio. You know, like he, he wanted to make a very specific movie. It was up to the studio to say, yeah, that's the movie we want to make. Here's the thing. I actually think that his vision of the Fantastic Four movie could have worked in a universe where we had already seen a good version of the Fantastic Four movie to begin with. For example, like right now, the best Fantastic Four movie ever created is Brad Bird's The Incredibles. It's very much a Fantastic Four movie, uh, you know, with, with a couple of twists on there. Imagine a universe where we had seen that two or three times, and then Josh Trank got the chance to take this dark, I mean, advanced twist on it. I, I have not seen the movie. I don't know how it holds together even narratively. You know, and, and, and there's one thing to say the tone's wrong, and there's another thing to say the plots go nowhere, and it just doesn't, it's not a complete film. Haven't seen it, don't know. My friends have seen it, that's their complaint. It's not just, ah, it's too dark, it's just too pointless or the characters aren't developed or this or that, you know? Yeah. Well, certainly so. And, and I think the, the, you know, what we, what we see in theaters by any account, by any and every account is something that was tinkered with quite a bit and, and, and owes quite a lot to very, very, very heavy reshoots. Uh, and, and so it, it, it has become very weird to judge whatever is in theaters for what, you know, when Josh Trank is out by himself saying, I had a great version of this movie and you guys will never see it. Uh, you know, he is making the argument that there was something good and now it is bad by, by way of studio involvement. I think the, the problem that you face is what is your concept and, and is it what people want to see? What, now, what I do think is real is like and, and in the same way there's Star Wars anthology movies, I would love, love for Marvel to get into once every three years. The what ifs. What give ifs us, give us a what if anthology for the Marvel Universe. Cast new actors. Get some new young person as Captain America, as Tony Stark. Do a rad, super offbeat, weird comedy, horror, whatever you want kind of what if story with this property. I think would be fantastic. And I think that's what this mm-hmm. idea could be. But it's not the flagship Fantastic Four movie. Agreed. So my point is that... Uh, I've heard a lot of stuff about what behind the scenes and some people that were there uh, in in New Orleans when this was going on. And and regardless of all of that, uh, you know, listen, somebody came to us and asked us to do it. We say yes. Their fault. Somebody asks you if you are a god. We're you not the grown ups. Yes. yes. Yeah. We're not the grown ups here. Hey, do you guys want to make a Star Wars film? Ah. Nah, I'm I'm happy at this, you know, small indie budget thing, you know, and 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 so a lot of bad decisions were made. But there Fair were enough. people who have a hell of a lot more experience in film and producing stuff that were involved in that. 
And I would say that I would say that maybe the choices were all wrong, but there was one choice, one important key choice that was the first bad decision, which was what going oh. to a first time director who directed, not wrote a four million dollar movie that was a really fun, fun movie, genre defining, but really relied heavily on Max Landis' script that Max Landis did a great script that then to say, OK, now we're going to put you in charge of one hundred and twenty million dollar production without any intermediary thing and also not knowing fully how do your things get visualized is, is that, you know, it was perhaps a, a you look at the other directors they chose. Can you uh, I, I, as long as we're just making stuff up here, uh, uh, can, can I would love to hear each of you guys kind of sketch out because understand I am somebody who has always, always deeply, deeply loved the Fantastic Four franchise, all the way from uh, it was one of the earliest cartoons I remember watching. Even when uh, you know they gave, uh, I think the Human Torch his own spinoff thing and replaced him with a robot. Uh, I read it through the comics, uh, all the way through when the Thing uh, decided to stay on the Beyonders Secret Wars planet because he could occasionally look like a human being here or there and was replaced with She Hulk. Uh, I loved all of those incarnations. I even stomached and liked enough you know the the some of the recent movies um i have very specific ideas about what i would like to see to see the fantastic four movie have justice done to it but i would love to hear what you guys think if let's say let's say they called us up and said hey tranks out obviously uh you guys do a movie what what would you pitch wait for which for for, for, for fantastic, fantastic four, four man Oh, so, you know, I think that for that, you, if, if we're producers and picking talent and stuff, I mean, the, the heart of the Fantastic, and that's the thing, too, is Fantastic Four is a character drama. It is the character drama, and that's that's another thing where I'm like, man, to put that in Trank's hands is, you know, very, very uh, difficult. And Tensor Guy says he disagrees with me. The beginning was good and looked less retouched. We don't know what was there. We yeah. don't know what was originally there or what was Trank's thing. We've heard this thing that was the, the end. We don't know. And so for any of us to say, oh, what he was going to do was great or not, I was in that edit room. You weren't. We don't, you know, I can tell you what, you know, there was. And I can tell you that sign of a guy who comes out the eve the movie's about to be released and trashes it is not a good sign. This is not somebody who sounds like would be really good on set. No. You know. Um, that's not helpful. That's not a helpful thing. Even if that's all true, that sort of says, wow. Fantastic Four is about characters. It's about how these people get along. This is how these, the relationships between these people. I would look for a, I would look for like, I mean, I'm so glad that like, you know, they chose the guys who did Lego movie to do Han Solo because when you can make the 21 Jump Street sequel work or the sequel movie, or 21 Jump Street movies work, you know, and it starts off with that, that movie where, you know, Lord and Miller have, you know, Channing Tatum crying because he can't go to prom. And you already feel for this guy in this very absurd movie, and the next one's just equally absurd, but you care about them. That's really, really powerful. So I'm going to look for somebody who's got really good character chops. Justin? Uh, the Fantastic Four is an allegory for fame uh, for me. Uh, you know, it is a story about people who suddenly have expectations and power that they did not expect, and it affects them in very different ways. The thing is Chris Farley or John Belushi. He is somebody who is uh, trapped in a physical state for which gives him power and 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 he can help people around him, and yet it destroys him inside. Uh, uh, Johnny Storm is your Lindsay Lohan, is your person who is literally, uh, you know, a, a danger to himself and others, but yet can help people. Reed Richards is the Tom Hanks, is somebody that gets it, but yet feels responsible for everybody around him that wants to bring them up. And and Sue Storm, uh, you know, is the invisible wife, you know, is, is somebody that is as brilliant as Reed Richards and, and as, as, as big of a part of this and yet is in the shadows. Uh, Doctor Doom is the greatest villain in the history of Marvel Comics. Uh, he is the person that actual villains uh, in this world do. They go to uh, weak countries and take them over and leverage them against the world. Uh, th this is a, a modern story. It has never been more relevant than it is in 2015 as we look at a, a, a universe in which SpaceX exists. We can go, the, you know, private entities. Somebody could be going to space right now that we just don't know about and for whatever reason uh, is, is not... Uh, carried or, or or covered, you know, 
uh, I'm the director. This is an amazing time to have the Fantastic Four be a, a, a real and prescient story. I would make it a, a it is the most modern franchise that I could imagine. And it, and it pains me that we did that we missed yet another opportunity at it. This is amazing because I think just in what you said, uh, you, you convinced me. You brought me over to your side because my whole my whole thought was that uh, when I think of the Fantastic Four, I think about all of my megrams going into the Captain America movie. There's no way a Captain America movie could actually work. It's too cheesy. It's too USA in a world where it's like, you know, most Americans are ashamed that we went invading Arab countries here and there and all this stuff. There's no way that they can make this work. But instead, they fixed it by making it a period piece, and they made it a study that harkened us back to those days when uh, when everybody wished they could join the military to go do their part for, for uh, you know, to, to fight Nazism and so on. And so my play was always, uh, just as Captain America did it, embrace that background and embrace that, that cheesiness and, you know, all that aw shucksness and uh and and take us along for the ride and I, I you know i would love to see a fantastic four movie set in the middle of the 1950s at the height of the cold war where you know, this is how we get to get, get our revenge against the, the the reds and so on uh uh because again you know fantastic four rose to fame uh, rose to prominence in the in the age of sputnik or i think it was late 60s is when it came out but but the point is um uh i, I think your story justin is better using the fantastic four as an allegory for fame is amazing because fantastic four is unique among characters in the marvel universe in that they've always embraced having their real names showcased right next to their their character but you know that's kind of an interesting thing though that's happened with the, the marvel cinematic universe is that uh, all of the main characters don't have secret identities. Yeah. Yep. Which Correct. Is, you know, uh, and they, they, they just said, let's it. get rid of the, I wonder if they'll find out, and just, just kind of run with it. Um, here's my suggestion for a director for the Justin Robert Young version of FF. Okay. This guy's handled action. This guy's handled comedy. He's actually, And he's handled Hollywood entertainment, fame, that aspect of it. This person has also handled a Marvel movie, Shane Black. Oh my God! I would die, die to see the Shane Black Fantastic Four movie. Which uh, wh which movie did Shane Black? Do? Iron Man Three, Lethal Weapon. The, the scriptwriter for Lethal Weapon, Kiss Got Kiss it. Bang Bang. He directed. Uh, reportedly, uh, you know, if you're looking for a non-controversial director, uh, you know, he is he is certainly somebody that has rubbed people the wrong way. Not so much recently. He apparently had a, a fairly good relationship doing Iron Man 3, but that was working with Robert Downey Jr., who is kind of his rabbi. Uh, but, uh, yeah, no, that, that that's perfect. Absolutely perfect to understand the, the elements of that. But it's like, here's the thing. What, what's, what's amazing about the Marvel Cinematic Universe is how much it has taken from the two franchises that it doesn't have. Spider-Man and Fantastic Four. Yeah. Spider-Man and Fantastic Four. Exactly what you said, Andrew. None of, the, none of the Avengers have secret identities in the way that they do in the comics. That's exactly Fantastic Four. Fantastic Four, you know, at the point in Iron Man 2 when, when he says, yeah, uh, so, you know, I'm Tony Stark. Here's my address. Come at me, bro. Like that is, you know, everyone knows where the Baxter building is. The yeah. Baxter building constantly gets attacked by people because they know where the fan, where, where the Fantastic Four live. And that weighs on Reed Richards that I'm bringing this upon my family, even if they're super powered and everybody else that lives and works in this place. Uh, so, you know, the, 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 the quick quip of Spider-Man is, is all over the MCU. So, Oh man. I mean it just it's just so sad. I'm 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 hopeful that maybe this has been so radioactive that uh Fox is motivated to uh you know to make let some go kind of up their agreement. Take it back, Disney. Own it that crap. Happen. Own it that crap. I don't think it will. Uh, I, I'll tell you the smart strategy on Fox is announce another FF movie. Announce well, it now, new have director. It scheduled. What's that? They have it scheduled. They have it scheduled. And I think, I think say, yeah, it's going to be maybe the same actors. Same actors. Because, you know, they got a great cast for it. No. Great cast. I, I, liked, I liked everybody uh, in the cast. And the fact that, uh, uh, you know, Michael B. Jordan, I think Michael B. Jordan could be a great 
Johnny Storm, and and he is completely wasted in a movie in which they're all supposed to be dour and upset about their powers because he's the one character that's like, yes, finally, like I get to fly and I light on fire and everyone wants my junk. This is the best. And I, I have I have a way for Fox to spin it. Go ahead. Because there was talk early on that that that. Fantastic Four and X-Men might do a crossover because they own both those properties and they might do a Fantastic Four X-Men crossover. As this movie came closer to being released, it then got announced that, no, no, separate universes. Yeah. So now, oh no, yeah, turns out that was Earth 2 or whatever. It's DC's Earth 2, we don't know. But anyhow, we're doing a new FF movie, but it's in a different, it's in the same universe as the X-Men. Dude, that would be amazing. I mean, so, I mean, the, the, the natural would be let's do a Fantastic Four movie with a popular X-Men character, and there is no more popular than Wolverine. Wolverine. Stylock. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that, I mean, again, you know, I don't know, you know, Hugh Jackman, I think they want to use him like a, you know, uh, an aging but quite you know quite good pitcher you know they, I think they want to bring him out sparingly as much as they can I think it all comes down to sort of plot line or whatever but uh, and th this is the third X Men movie for which he said it's his final as Wolverine <laughs> yeah but I mean I understand too that like the guys in his mid forties in training and everything else like that every time he's got to go do and again he you look at what he, how you know look how jacked he is compared to the first Wolverine he keeps getting bigger and bigger but that's that's one of the things all the Avengers sort of, you know, gross, gross about, gross about is the fact, gross, gross, you know, all those things complain about is that the amount of training. You look at, you look at Chris Hemsworth when he's not playing Thor and Chris Hemsworth when he's Thor, there's, it ain't the same guy, you yeah. know? Yeah. Uh, by the way, I will say one last thing about the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I uh, was reading some of the, footage they showed of civil war uh and, and people can read it if, if, if you would like the spoilers all i will say is that the scene they showed is one in which they bring in uh ant-man into the fold of of the side he is on uh and it, it i i really dug ant-man I, I liked ant-man a lot uh cameo ant-man i'm so excited or cameo, just one liner, the funny guy in the group, uh, Ant Man. It is just like just the description of that one scene and his dialogue was just so exciting to me. I am so thrilled for Civil War. Wow. All right, right on. Hey, um, speaking of comics, I know we're about to start into picks. Uh, Justin, did you by any chance get around to reading Lock and Key? I don't want to. No, okay. I, I haven't started reading it yet. Or uh, rereading it. I mean, I, I read through the first four graphic novels, and I haven't started uh, picking it up yet. No. Okay, well then, I'll hold off on grilling you on that. Uh, <clears throat> I'm still staring uh, at the first Patreon. Uh, you, you can support us. Uh, Patreon.com slash weird things. Uh, that is where you can go ahead and give us money. We talk about a lot of things, many of them weird, some of them pop culture. Uh, this was one of the pop culture episodes, but if you dig on that and you want to hear more of what we would do with various different franchises for which we love, then go ahead and check it out. It is we are patreon.com slash weird things. Thank you to everybody who makes this show possible. Hey guys, I, pardon me, but is this the Parsec Award nominated podcast that we're talking what? about? What? Yeah. Indeed. So that would be yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, so those of you who don't know, uh, Weird Things has been nominated for a Parsec Award um, with some very, very, uh, very, very accomplished other podcasts there. So uh, there's that. Yeah, ever, uh, never, never won a Parsec Award. Um, it would be amazing to win a Parsec Award the same day I got married. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, uh, I mean, could people vote or something? What can they do? I think they have a committee of people who vote. So we can bribe, I'm sure. And uh, I want a big shout out. Thanks to Bryce for it was his effort to put us out there and put us on the map and to go through all the work to go do that. And so without which it would not have happened. 
So there we go. We uh, have been nominated in Best Fact Behind the Fiction Podcast, That's podcasts fact. that explore the facts that influence the fictions, the science, the history, the culture, and the mythology that inspire the stories. Uh, the finalists are some other guys and us. So thank you very, very much to the uh, the, the Parsec Awards. Uh, or sorry, so thank you to you guys for helping nominate us. And then, uh, you know, we humbly submit to the podcast, or the Parsec Awards, that uh, if we don't win, we'll we'll curse you. Well, or, or commit suicide. Our deaths will be on your hands. Yeah, blood's on your hands. <laughs> hey, um, uh, real quick, I know we're about to start picks. Um, last week, my pick was uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's Aurora. Have you, uh, d- by, by any chance, did you get the chance to read it, Andrew? Okay. If you do, please talk to me about it. Because, like, of everyone I know, I think I would really, really dig your take on it. All right, see what I can do. If it'll make you happy. Okay, fine. So if we're picking picks, uh, again, mine is uh, Star Wars Rebels. I was really surprised at how, uh, I don't know, how um, easy it was to, 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 to fall into it. I really dug Star Wars Rebels. It's very much a kid show, uh, but uh, totally worth your, what, 20 bucks to buy a season of it on uh, Amazon.com. And, uh, of course, you could watch it on Disney XD. Mm-hmm. You have the Disney XD app. It's there. And uh, they just started off with the season premiere for season two was with the Siege of Lothal. So it's fun. Right on. Uh, here's my pick. Um, my, my pick is uh, uh, about a family called the Smiths. Um, it is a nonfiction story. It is uh, about... The, uh, the, the dynastic rise of, of, of a family that uh, has built generation on generation, starting uh, at, at the turn of the 20th century uh, with a uh, you know, son of a uh, preacher uh, who uh, was relocated from Long Island to Columbus. Uh, it is almost this Forrest Gump-like tale of America. This family is just involved in almost every element at the point where it is at, at its most interesting. Uh, American Steel, finance, World War II, Ohio State football. Like It, it gets to a point, oil drilling. It, it gets to a point where it's almost ridiculous that these people are just because they are fairly, by the way of this nonfiction uh, reporting, just fairly decent people. Uh, and eventually it ends with uh, two of uh, the the main characters in the story becoming presidents uh, of the United States. Hopefully you have enjoyed the idea of this story and therefore you will give it a non-political listen because as I do, I just want to do my best to understand the world around me and understand that it is not the Smiths, but the Bushes. It's a, uh, a very well-written and well-reported story for uh, what I've listened to it so far. Uh, and it gives you, uh, it has given me a, a fuller sense of, of this family for which, like it or not, and whether or not you agree with them politically, uh, has, has been a part of our lives. And uh, what, what I have taken from it is that if you disagree with them politically, they uh, are probably pretty cool with you because uh, the, the idea of their family and where their family has come from was different than where I thought it came from based on this book. So go ahead and check it out. It is on Audible. Uh, the Bushes by Peter and Rochelle Schweizer. Speaking of producers of content who have the same last name as the other partner in there, I watched a movie. I had two different people recommend this to me. I said, hey, you should check this out. Uh, I think, Brian, you may have seen this. And... I remember the sci-fi story that it was based upon, so that affected my viewing of it, but I still enjoyed it nonetheless. If you like good, solid, classic science fiction, um, unless you have no soul, you probably love Robert Heinlein a lot. And Robert Heinlein material has been tried repeatedly to be adapted into films, and sometimes it actually works, or sometimes it works in low-budget ways, or overall works. You know, the biggest one, you know, comes to mind is Starship Troopers, which I think is it's a movie that still holds up. It's a fun movie. And so I think good. That, and Verhoeven captured a lot of what the satire and a lot of things that Heinlein was really trying to get at that eludes a lot of people. A lot of people think that it's, ah, oh, it's this jingoistic kind of thing. Like, no, go read the, you know, Heinlein was a complex guy who saw a lot of, you know, that. <laughs> by by uh, the way, side note, Verhoeven's two best movies are Starship Troopers and Black Book, which is 
uh, two very different films, but for for whatever reason, matches the very odd sense that uh, that Paul Verhoeven has as a, as a director. Uh, for the record, Robo-Cop. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna do you the favor as oh, a friend Robo-Cop. Yes, of I, yeah, okay, Robo-Cop pretending Cop. you said Robocop or yeah. Total Recall. Yeah, yeah. It, the, the, among his best films. Are. Among his best films. So anyhow, uh, there was a there was an adaptation years ago of the Puppet Masters of his, which I thought was 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 pretty fun, pretty cool. This is an adaptation of a short. I'm not even going to name the short story because if you know the short story, you go read it. Then it might influence you. The less you know, the better. And I'm talking about Predestination. Okay. So the Spherig brothers previously directed the movie uh, called Daybreakers, which was kind of in a world where like everybody is pretty much a vampire, which was fun. I would say that it was 80 percent to being really awesome, 20 percent a little uneven, but I still really enjoyed it. So they did. Predestination stars Ethan Hawke, and I thought it was a very, very solid, fun movie. If you like classic sci-fi, it's not a big, huge movie. It's more like an extended Twilight Zone episode, okay? Right now, it's only available, I think, for rental or to buy. It's not on Netflix yet or anything else yet, but I think if you like classic sort of stuff, it's evolves time travel and a time-traveling temporal agent, and I watched it last night and really had fun with it, enjoyed it. But again, it's not going to be for everybody. Some people are going to be like, what, uh, what's this? You know, I'm like, well, it's, I'm, I warned you. It won. <laughs> it won. That's, that's a ringing endorsement. That, uh, why is that not on the movie poster? I warned you, Andrew Main. <laughs> uh, but I mean, just so you know, it, it won uh, awards wise. It won like After Dark. Uh, it won, this, won like the Toronto After Dark Film Festival, special award for best sci-fi film, best screenplay. Audience Award for Best Feature, which is, you know, a smaller festival. It's still a pretty cool festival, a lot of cool things into it. So it was second place for Audience Award and Feature Film. Um, and it won some other awards there, too. So I think it nominated and won. So I think I enjoyed it. I had a couple, two different friends tell me, have you seen this? And they both liked it, and I liked it. Are you, uh, are you excited for Man in the High Castle coming back with a full, decent budget and whatnot? So I heard the, the budget for the original was a lot higher than I realized. Oh, no. Because <laughs> that was like, your wow, big right, You still right? had, like, really bad green screen effects. I'm excited. I'm, I'm hopeful. I think that it's a big, ambitious thing, and I think with the left time and all that, I, I, I'm excited to see what the filmmakers do. Is, is Ethan Hawke the best replacement-level leading man ever? Like, he is competent that in a good script he can, he can shine – in a bad script, he doesn't really elevate it. Uh, but, like, he has found himself, he's such a, like, he is compelling enough that we always want to see him. He's certainly more charismatic than, like, a Paul Walker or something like that. Sure. But not quite a somewhat, uh, a charisma monster that we want to always follow from, from movie to movie. Uh, I would agree with that. Uh, he's the Kevin Bacon of the 21st century, right? Oh, I don't know. I think Kevin Bacon is is somebody that, like, charisma wise, you kind of want to follow. People watch things because Kevin Bacon is in it. I don't they, think a lot of people do watch now, things. Cause... They do now, but I remember, like, back in the 80s, there was some, like, uh, you know, Showtime exclusive interview. And he said, uh, Look, I am not as talented as other actors, which is why I have to work twice as hard. And uh, I, I, I would believe that about Ethan Hawke as well. Well, uh, except. Yeah, go ahead. There, there, my, my favorite Kevin Bacon story, and I mean, it's, it's a sad part of his life, is that after he accepted the role for Tremors, that he fell on the ground, literally walked out of his office, walked out of the office and fell down on the ground in front of his wife, just so upset with where his career had gone. Just so upset with, look what's happened to me. I'm doing this underground worm movie. This is what's happened. And it's such an awesome movie now that, you know, in the, in the lore of Bacon, it's like, uh, thank you for doing that movie ah. and elevating that movie because you and Fred Ward are just awesome. Uh, well, I mean, he's, he's Kevin Bacon, uh, uh, legendary good guy, was so nice on the set of Super and, and made such an impression on James Gunn that when James Gunn does Guardians of the Galaxy, he makes Kevin Bacon the echoing, <laughs> you know, uh, hero of, of Earth in that script, uh, you know, to to prove how amazing... Uh, he is in Footloose. So, you know, Kevin Bacon's great. And and, and I, I really like Ethan Hawke. I, and and I, I think that to say he is a replacement level, uh, you know, is, is probably too catty uh, of, of a term because you need supreme, very specific skill to be a leading man 
in Hollywood to, to be a leading man for movies like that's not everybody can do it. There are many, 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 many people who try and either A, aren't selected to do it or B, can't carry it if they are chosen. Ethan Hawke can. It's just very interesting, you know, where he is. You know, and it's weird because you, you, you always want to know what the story is behind the story and, and, and how difficult it is for actors out there and the people you recognize, you know, and you like. And then you go like, you know, Ethan Hawke, you know, the mid to late 90s had a great stretch. And then, you know, for whatever reason, we didn't see him in some of these other kinds of films. And then, you know, he pops up in, you know, a movie like Predestination, which is a small movie. It's just, he, was in, he was in Daybreakers, too, worked with him in that movie. And then he pops up in uh, this and I think does a great job. I think he does a really, really good job of it. Uh, he did the, did the Purge for uh, Blumhouse. So, you know, he's working, a consistently working guy who works a lot. And everybody knows who he is. But, you know, Hollywood's weird. And was in Sinister, right? He was in Cargill's movie. Yep. Yeah, he was the lead there. And did well enough that there's a sequel, you know? So cheers to Ethan Hawke, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, hard hat leading man of Hollywood. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. How's it been, bros? It's been Star Wars land. We didn't even talk about that. Okay, real quick. We'll save it for after things. Okay. Weird. This episode brought to you by a small batch bacon jerky, which I bought because I was at Whole Foods and I saw something that said bacon jerky and I got all excited, reached for the package and then saw that it was for dog treats. And I was really happy to see they make this for humans. So, <laughs> oh, my God, that's embarrassing. I'm like, oh, I look over and I see this bacon jerky. <laughs> Homer Simpson derp face. And I start to reach for it. I'm like, dang it. Dog treat below it. Sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, for some reason, I played I played um, the Diamond Club Hopes. You enjoyed this oh, no, stinger, no. and now, well, here, look. This is what this is what I see. I <laughs> see the word Winamp. Can you can you just hit space to stop it or? Uh, no. Apparently, space doesn't stop it. It's B. Nope. That's next track. V. You have to hit V for stop. Nice. Well, that's intuitive. Yeah, right? <laughs> All right. Well, gang, you want to know what? I mean, I, I'm, I'm probably only going to be able to do like a half hour before I start packing up and heading to the airport so I can get my ass to Austin. Where do you got to go? To your house, son. Oh, that's right. As we're done with that to things, I want the golf sucker. <laughs> for you, Ninny. <laughs> Ninny. Uh, okay. All right. Well, look. If we're doing a bio break, I'm gonna take advantage of it. You have the con, sir. Uh, hey, listen, man. I know there's a lot of people out there who are like, "Hey, Justin, Brian, Andrew. It's kind of weird when y'all just talk about movies and stuff." But like, what do you think feeds everything else? That we just have these cinematic retellings of all these different kinds of cryptids and uh, supernatural phenomenon just out of thin air. Hell no, folks. It comes from our love of popular fiction. And if we do not renew that every once in a while by discussing the popular fiction around us, then you, dear viewer and listener, have an incomplete story when we go on our jags. So I uh, delight in everybody who enjoy these episodes. I would ask anybody who did not enjoy these episodes so much to please have patience. And I hope that we can all enjoy these fictions as we go through. So that is my thought on that. Uh, Neshcom. Hi, Jerry. Hi, Neshcom. Uh, Star Carl, Wars is real, guys. Yeah. Um. Neshcom jury. Assuming ice cold open recordings won't happen this trip. I don't know, man. I mean, I'm going to be there all day tomorrow. So, uh, you know, we'll find out. I mean, like, I'm going to show up tomorrow or tonight, like at midnight. And so most of the recordings that we do for ice cold opens don't happen at like eight o'clock in the evening. Uh, you know, we will be there for any horse boys that are up. We will. Try to text them, but uh, you know, if we do Hearth and Oats or Ice Cold Opens or whatever, they'll be available for everybody. 
Yeah, dang straight. Uh, and, and yeah, and my, my business in Texas does not take place until 7 p.m. Monday. So I'm going to be doing that and then driving back to Austin. So it will be late for Night Attack, but uh, in all my exes, I have all day. Say what? Nothing. Okay. Oh, your exes. It's not moving out of Texas. Got it. Uh, what do you guys want to talk about for after things? I have a topic. Okay. All right. Then take it away in 5, 4, 69, 25, and go. Welcome to the After Things podcast, where we talk about things after weird things, generally speaking. Justin Robert Young. C. Brian Brushwood. Yo. And I'm Andrew Main. So we, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about just uh, the new Star Wars films and weird things, because we're that dorky. And we will talk about Star Wars land in a moment, but I have a very important topic I want to talk about here. Go on. Shoot. Okay. The big part of what we want to do about After Things is we talk about being creators and the challenges of being creators and, and the different things we work through and what we learn, a lot of what we've learned, and we're all trying to figure out our way there. Um, I came across a news item uh, that I thought was very interesting that I don't know if you guys are aware of, but you know, it's a it's a very good you know, uh, it just was just a posting really about a project that somebody embarked upon that was extremely successful, way way more than you can imagine. And I would love for us to dissect and analyze it because uh, it's inspiring. And I think it might be inspiring to all of us here. And uh, I guess it was a Kickstarter project involving a card game uh, that was like political based, politics based. Actually, I would actually really love to yes. dissect this. Capital Steps, the card game available yes. now. So for those of you that live under a rock, under a tree, Mr. Justin Robert Young, who's actually on the podcast with us right now, Along with some other very creative people and talented people, we can we know he worked with other people because it looks very pretty. Came up with a card game based on kind of a apples versus apples, cards against humanity, but based upon the idea that you're trying to debate your friends in a political debate using the cards you draw. They wanted to reach fifteen thousand dollars. The goal was to get fifteen thousand. Oh, the ninety-nine dollar level, Brian. I'm at the hundred fifty. But anyhow, they wanted to do. Uh, dude, I, uh, for the record, that was an intentional middle finger to Justin for not having a hundred dollar <laughs> item. Like all of the calculus says that a hundred dollars is the single most popular moment or, or, or place to be. So I did ninety nine dollars and I accepted. Imagine what Bill Gates could have done if he went to college. Yeah. yeah. So. uh so anyhow, uh, they wanted Justin wanted to try to reach fifteen thousand dollars, and before the thing launched, basically, if they didn't reach fifteen thousand, Justin was pretty convinced, and rightly so, that he'd be a failure. That all this time yeah. he spent online interacting with you would have been a complete waste, and he should have stayed in New York filing building permits or something like that, never embarking upon the wild adventure that took him back to Florida and podcasting, working with me and Brian and all this other stuff and meeting new people. That would have been a horrible decision. You would all be worthless to him, and it all righted on finding out if he could meet the $15,000 goal. And did you? Uh, I did, uh, and we did. Uh, the, the the contender team has been very excited as we are now barreling towards $73,000. We are closing in on being five times funded. We have nearly 1,500 uh, backers, which is just insane. Uh, you know, if, if you look at where other successful card games, not only through Kickstarter, but afterward, people who just uh, have, have successful lifespans on Amazon – uh, we we match up very favorably to a lot of those use cases. It, it is all because of everybody that has listened here uh, on on Weird Things and, and Night Attack and uh, the Morning Stream and so many other podcast uh, outlets. But uh, yeah, no, it's been over the top. It's been crazy. So I'm going to tell you my analysis of why this has been wildly successful, and I've compared it to some people we know who have been doing some other campaigns that have a huge, huge, huge social media footprint that haven't even, you know, haven't got close to what he's been able to do with his team. Step one, great product. Yeah. Great idea, great product. What we see, we see a finished product that looks great, is really well done. A lot of times people jump into Kickstarter with an idea for a product that they could take a lot further on their own before they ask for money, but they don't. They take a half-assed idea and like, oh, yeah, I want to do this. Here's a rendering of what this thing could look like. They won't spend a day 
trying to make a thing look good, but then they're going to go ask you for your hard-earned money to try to make something launch. And that's the number one, besides you know something unrealistic, I think that's a big mistake many people make with Kickstarters. It's they just get into it half-assed. They won't spend their own effort. They won't spend their own time until somebody else puts money down into it, and that's wrong. You guys put a lot of effort, a lot of time and energy into a great product. It looks good. It's realistic. You thought through the gameplay. I can see the mock-ups or whatever you had done that just look effing great. Pardon my language here. I see a very fully realized thing, and I understand clearly you guys are asking for money to then go print these things. You took as, took it as far as you could in your own spare time to the point you're like, okay, we need money to pay for a press run, not money to sit on our butts for six months while we dream up the rest of the game, which people do yeah. like, yeah, I want to do this thing. If you guys pay me a salary to do it, I'll do it. And those things most often fail, fall apart because those people, they can't finish it before they ask you for money. They ain't going to finish it after they got the money. Part so, of it is is just understanding, and this is a lot of what I've learned from you and Brian, uh, of just you know there are hard realities to producing things. That that producing things, the exciting part of 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 of, of entrepreneurism is the idea of of making the dreams in your head reality, right? The 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 actual wizardry to it is figuring out how you can buy and source and 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 create that kind of stuff. There's a million miles between your dream and and the creation. For the contender, we spent about a week and a half debating on whether or not we wanted to do Kickstarter. You know, uh, on whether or not we just wanted to put it out on pre-release and make a big deal uh, 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 about that, or we wanted to do Kickstarter. Kickstarter ultimately was the best decision for us. A, because it gives us a chance to just order bigger and more and better because we have a gigantic amount of capital up front, and because thanks to exploding kittens and and uh, a lot of other uh, you know really exciting tabletop games, this is just a place where people are they. This is the best card game store in the on the internet is kickstarter so it's just a good place to get found it's a great platform too because you know when you have a product and the thing that i've tried to learn and, and brian understands very much from you know brian's having launched a bunch of stuff now is there's hey there's going to be a thing you can buy buy this thing now early and you get this advantage hey, now you can buy this thing, but while you buy it, you know, this is the special window to buy it. And yes, you can still buy it. But that lead up to when you can buy it and doing that really well. And there's that. What's wonderful about Kickstarter is sometimes you want to announce something, but you're afraid to sell it early because like, oh, man, if I don't get my supplier, I get this. I don't want to look like an ass. Here, you're like, hey, we have this thing. If everybody clicks buy and we reach this level, then we collect your money. You know, that escrow sort of idea is wonderful. It's absolutely a wonderful way to do it. And you were, it was absolutely the right thing to put it on Kickstarter, as you've seen, because you also have this period of like 30 days or whatever you want to say of like, hey, it's coming. It's coming. This is the news. This is the news about the news. This is, this is how you can have a whole cycle of playing upon all the little updates, everything else that happens. You have, hey, we're going to launch a Kickstarter on this day. We've launched the Kickstarter. Now we're drumming this up, and there's so much information out there about how to do a really good Kickstarter. You guys have knocked it out of the park. You're at $73,000 right now, or close to that. You've got 14 days to go. You've got two weeks to go on this thing. And, you know, I think that you're in your building momentum. You've already been covered in Fast Company. You've got Daily Dot. Your other stuff is coming. I think, uh, you know, we've, I've mentioned to you some people I know who said that they're going to cover it. So yep. I think that. You guys are going to hundred k. I'm, I'm, I'm. You know, the the tracking and all that. I think says that you guys are going to hit that. How how close has the reality been to your expectations going into this? Um, you know, and and again, you know, not not to not 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 to blow smoke, but it's having ridden so close to the both of you on gigantic, big, like launching thing deals. Uh, has kind of divorced me from having, I have a, I have many visions, right? Like when we started it, it's like, okay, here's the underperforming vision and how we're going to handle it. Here's the moderately successful vision, how we're going to handle it. Here's the successful vision and how we're going to handle it. This has been the successful vision. We are, if now, like, to be honest, I feel more pressure on the, on it now than I would have if we were at like 8,000 with, with 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 13 days to go sure because at at 8000 let's just get to 15 
you know, and, and, you know, if you look at, you know, how most of the money comes in in the first and the last 48 hours, you know, the, the, it would be something that we could just like try to do our best. And if we got up to 20, it would be a huge success at 73 with nearly half of our time to go. Uh, we've proven that it's a product that people that is sticky with people. The idea of politics meets cards against humanity is something that people like. And now the pressure's on to just get as much press as possible because it's already been shown that the more people just see it, the more people like it and, 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 and want to, and want to sign in. So now well, it's like, let's really go all out because the difference between 70 and a quarter million is, is to me really only in us hustling and, and just getting people to cover so, it. So in that regard, uh, do you mind kind of peeling about back the curtain a little bit about you're doing some counterintuitive things in that all of your stretch goals don't involve money. Where, like, where did that yeah. come from? Um, you know, Andrew you was just at 73,000. You what was that? just hit 73,000. Hell yeah. Uh, so uh, Andrew and I were talking about, you know, the idea of uh, your audience, you know, uh, who you are talking to and what they want and how they want to be talked to. Uh, we have found, and this is something that I had kind of suspected in, in how we deal with stuff. You know, when we talk about Patreon stuff, you know, every once in a while we, we have number goals. But for us, it's like we're so dealing with house money with Patreon that like, you know, a lot of the times when we talk about money number goals, it's almost like, ah, look at us. We won the lottery. We keep winning the lottery. This is crazy. Uh, but a lot of times when you're really serious about it, you talk about backers and not money because backers mean money. Uh, the more people that you have giving you money, the more likely they are to give you more money. And at that point, you are playing a advantageous game. They're in the they're in the tent and you just need to make them love you. And and you're good at that if they're in the tent in the first place. So just keep doing what you're doing and, and, and finances will follow. Well, what we saw with uh, Exploding Kittens, which is the most uh, successful Kickstarter for a card game and I think probably ever – which made like $14 million or something like that, is that all of their goals, uh, stretch-wise, didn't mention money. They all mentioned backers. They mentioned Facebook likes. They mentioned uh, Twitter likes. Uh, you know, they mentioned social engagement, people doing silly things and posting them on their Twitter and, and Instagram and stuff like that. So basically, once you've hit your stretch goals, you already have a fire. They were just saying, no, 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 gasoline. All we want is gasoline. Forget and more fire. Forget whatever. Fire will happen. We just need more gasoline. That's a great point because I think the problem what happens is that you make a financial commitment to something. And you're like, all right, I will pledge this much money. And then to go back and say, hey, give us more money, you know, is a challenge. And you can kind of justify it through other means. But if you're saying, no, help us reach people, help us do this other stuff, whatever, I think that's that's smart and it's a way to because how do you how do you get your energized base to champion you even more and in and, and some some organizations or some enterprises they try to just feed off of that group more and more and more until people just go like i'm out i'm done i can't do yeah. anymore where others you know say okay help us tell everybody obviously we have proof that this is a great idea so if you tell other people about it they'll be glad you did well and, and dc uh, tv 41 638 says do both though but my point is that one follows the other, you know, like you just don't have to say it and you don't have to make that the focus of it. If you get more Twitter followers and you get more Facebook followers and you get more backers, you will have more money. And in fact, you'll probably make more money than if you said we need to get to a hundred thousand. We'll never say for the contender that we need to get to a quarter million in my head. I would like to get to a quarter million because that would be really, really rad. And I want to do the best thing I can to do that. And to me, the last thing I want to do, I mean, for you guys on the After Things show where we're kind of peeling behind the curtain, I'll say it. But it's like I'm never going to go on my Twitter and be like, the race to a quarter million is on. Please give me a quarter million dollars like that. That is, is it turns people off. It becomes about the money and not about the project. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, and, and, and that can be and that can be fine. But I mean, it's when you look at Kickstarters that fail, and obviously a card game is a lot easier than making a drone or making some electronics thing. And for you know a bunch of starry-eyed young engineers who want to create something great, there's going to be a hell of a lot of things that are getting their way. And we need to be kind of we need to be forgiving about some of those deliberately deadlines being a little bit too optimistic. We don't need to be forgiving about people who don't give you updates, though. People who don't up you once you give people money or pledge money, and then they don't tell you what's going you on, and they get owe angry. They're like, updates. you don't yeah. know what it's like. No, yeah. I don't. I'm just writing you a check. Just yeah. tell us, you know. Did your did your guy go to Asia and did he have a trouble finding a, you know, a right buyer because you realized the factory was lying to you or this or whatever? Tell us. That's content, bro. That's yep. that, that's a fascinating story <laughs> that we would love to tell us the story of where our money has ended up. By yeah, the way, it, one of my favorite ideas for a Kickstarter, which was John's, who I worked with the, uh, on the contender, is he wanted to do a Kickstarter for enthusiastic production delays. So it would just be like he would raise money, and then uh, once he hit his funding goals, he would just forever write you uh, why his uh, these production delays are not are, are not coming uh, on time. He would write production delays about his production delays. So it would just be an art project where he would just write about uh, you know how he's not making it happen. Real quick. DCTV four one six three eight. Putting a more likely goal of hundred k might mean getting to hundred k sooner, which would make the likelihood of getting to two hundred and fifty k higher. You have a higher estimation of me than my mother, and I love you very, 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 very much. DCTV four one six three eight. Because I would love to have understood when we launched this uh, th th this game that we were uh, rocketing toward $100,000. Uh, uh, believe you me, that was unknown to me. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and you know, the Kickstarter goal, I think that sometimes people put unrealistic numbers there. Like, well, why not shoot for this? Well, I'll tell you why. Because on Kickstarter, if you don't reach your funding goal, you, you don't fail. get it. It's not any go-go where you get the money. And also, nothing is sadder than a Kickstarter with a really ambitious goal, and you look like five days in, six days in, it's got... Eighty dollars or ninety dollars, oh, because a lot of people look at that's poison. That's like and that. also like if you're making a card game and people are like, why do you need a hundred thousand dollars for a card game? You know, this was a a very realistic, and I feel better about. Oh man, I'm I'm championing something that's gonna. Bl we've already blown past this. There's the the proof is they said we think this idea is worth fifteen thousand, and the world said no, bro, you're worth seventy three thousand right now. I'm like, well, the crowd's spoken. I'm gonna get with them. And 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 there is uh, there's there's a marketing element to that. The idea that you are a story, you know, in uh, from coming from a newspaper perspective and, and media perspective, uh, you understand that press comes. All the press we've gotten has has been personal connections. By the way, we sent out a bunch of emails and we've contacted a bunch of people. We have gotten zero. When it comes to that, we had a personal connection with Fast Company. We had a personal connection with Daily Dot. Those are the two biggest things that we did. And then there's a few others that are uh, hopefully coming that have come via personal connection. Now, all of our backer goals uh, are either, there are a lot of creative ones. And the big thing that we're pushing now are pictures uh, with people playing or showing the game in presidential libraries and on the campaign people who are at campaign events, people who are with candidates showing off the cards. Because if you're going to get press, that's how you do it. You tell a story. The story of the contender is that it is a part of the 2016 presidential race. Right. Uh, it is the game that associates with it. Well, and uh, that's the exciting thing is not only, you know, have you guys created a good game that, that ties into something that's in the gestalt that everyone's thinking of, but on top of that, you spend the next eight to nine or 12 months, uh, at any given moment, the contender could become the punchline of a debate. It could become yeah. something that's just a switch gets flipped and all of a sudden the whole w nation knows about it. Uh, you know, and, and that's the hope. The hope is is that we're there and, and we have shown what is encouraging is that we've shown the conversion rate. Like there has been a very favorable conversion of attention to money uh, and, and attention to action. Uh, you know, uh, what, what, what's, what's the Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross thing? <laughs> uh, uh, A-I-D-A, attention, interest, decision, action. <laughs> you know, we've, we have seen... A high uh, version of, of 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 that, which is which is very 
uh, you know, very heartening and, and to me just makes it to me, it puts a lot more pressure on me to, to try and, and make other press happen because we just know if we get it, it, there, there will be fruit. We know that it will bear fruit. Uh, all right, so, real quick. Tench- guy. Oh, yeah, why not into go, go, uh, do you think Kickstarter is the right cache? It feels more legitimate or what? True story. About six months ago, Kickstarter, sorry, Indiegogo randomly contacted me uh, because they were looking to do surveys about uh, creators on Patreon. They just wanted to understand why creators went to Patreon, what they were looking for, what their benefits were, what the challenges were. They then came back to me and said, hey, listen, if you'd like to put out a thing on, uh, on, on, on your podcast and let other people who donate to your Patreon take our survey, we'll give them all $25 Amazon gift certificates. And I did it. I had a relationship with Indiegogo. I could have went back to Indiegogo and said, hey, listen, would you like to be a part of this? We, we, I mean, we, we'll, we'll list with you if you can promise us that you'll give us a, uh, a, a, a big push for it. And we didn't because Kickstarter was just the place. And here's where it bore fruit. This week, they put us out on their email of projects they love. We were listed among two others and $20,000 fell from the sky. So that was a $20,000 decision to stay, to list on Kickstarter and be successful, to have the chance to be successful on Kickstarter. So that's, I feel good about our decision there. I think that, I think that you know, the momentum there, and I think also that, that Indiegogo, I think certain projects might be better, but Indiegogo also has that rep of, hey, whatever we can get, we get. <laughs> you, know? you know? It seems like more of a summer school approach to it. That's a horrible, horrible thing to say. But yeah. It, the problem is that Indiegogo created a brand because they were the projects that Kickstarter wouldn't list. Yeah. You know, uh, like, like Brian, uh, y- you did your scam uh, stuff. Scam launch, stuff? On yeah, Indiegogo. no, they, uh, it's against the rules. Kickstarter, you have to have a physical product that you could show off at the end, and we wanted to start a business. And they said, go get bent. We're Kickstarter. We're assholes. So we went off to Indiegogo, and it was a good thing. Uh, yeah. And now that would not be the case you'd be able to launch a business on, on, on Kickstarter because they relax their rules, which is, you know, as, as exemplified by the potato salad guy. Uh, but, uh, no, I, well, hold on. Have they, this is, yeah. uh, that okay. was, that was their whole, that was his whole thing was that I'm just going to make a potato salad because it was the day that they relaxed their rules. And then he wound up making like, got know, it, got it. Place. Right on. Brian, you were a trailblazer. Sure. Uh, <laughs> a pouty faced uh, uh, business starter. That's what I was. Well, no, I mean, and listen, Indiegogo and, and I, I don't want to disparage Indiegogo. Uh, you know, if, if it were not for uh, exploding kittens, I don't know if, if the, the pull to Kickstarter would be like that. But it's hard to not it's hard to turn down the platform that just raised 14 million dollars for a card game. Sure. Sure. You know, it, yeah. it, 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 it's hard to do that. I think, and that's, yeah, I think that's the, the, you know, is each platform has its own sort of strength for why you want to put something there versus somewhere else. And some projects, you know, are going to be much better off over on Indiegogo than that. But I think that it's, it's kind of like you sort of want to, you tend to go with, in, 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 and this is a bad, I mean, it's, the truth is you kind of go with, you know, who's got the big momentum there. You know, who's got, you know, who's the big, who's the giant? And, and we, Brian and I had this conversation about Facebook getting into video. And, you know, I, I'm not terribly thrilled about the way Facebook does a number of things, but I'll probably be making some videos just for Facebook because they're really eager to get people to see videos on Facebook right now and probably have a better chance of reaching my audience there than I do elsewhere, even though I may not be like, eh, you know, Amazon. Like, I am, like, just there's a New York Times article on Amazon right now, which, it's kind of probably feels like it's not the most well balanced thing, but you go, man, this sounds like a place I would not want to work for. And my fear as a writer is an Amazon's version of the future. You know, I'm living in a cubicle in some third world country, typing away books. Or an, al- or, or an algorithm's doing it. They don't even need us. You know. Yeah. But I move a lot of books through Amazon, so that's that's the beast. You know. Uh, yeah, certainly so. I mean, I think it, it, it's really what's what's best for the project. And, and if there's anything that that people can take away, it's that you 
just be realistic, man. The more that you can be honest with yourself and the world around you, uh, the easier life is in every element. And that is very, very, very important when it comes to projects, especially projects with other people. The more that you can, you can just understand where your strengths, where your weaknesses are, and understand what your conversation is with the people that you're talking to or prospectively would like to talk to. You know, like, so, like what, what is the conversation you want to start? So let's talk for a second about one of the things that's very interesting is, you know, who people like your product was a great on brand product. If you watch the jury podcast yeah. and we know your brand, the idea that you're a fun guy and you're like, hey, here's a way that we can be fun together and a fun thing. You, what you like about me, I put this in a box with the help of some other. I don't want to despair. You, you've got some amazing people that contributed this, which you've done a great job of giving them credit to. But they're strangers to me. They're aliens. Okay. Sure. So you created a thing that's very, 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 very much on brand. Okay. I have a following, right? If I went out right now, I'm like, guys, I got a diet book for you. People like, what? Yeah. Like, oh no, I, I, you know the the whole thigh sizer thing. I've got a new thigh sizer. It's amazing. Be like, what? Right. Yeah. You know? Just because it's totally off brand. Yeah, you know, sometimes things might feel on sort of related brand, and I've seen this with magicians. Will sometimes say, "Oh, I'll come out with you know a magic trick or something for people." Like, well, most of the people, if you're on TV and people like you as a magician, your biggest fan base likes to see what you do. They're not so much into, "I need a deck of cards like you," or "I need to buy this magic set," or "I need to buy that." And certainly, there is an audience that you can capitalize on that. But a lot of times, people who have a following, it's not quite on brand for them. I have a friend. Uh, Trey Ratcliffe, stuck in customs. So Trey's, you know, probably one of the, probably one of those famous photographers there is now on the internet. Big HDR guy, etc. Um, and I've known, I knew him before he got into that. I just ran into him in Philadelphia where he was doing a photo walk. So he had like a huge mob of like a Forrest Gump sized mob to follow him with cameras as they take photographs in Philadelphia. He created a, he's done some different things, teaching things like that. He teamed up with Peak Design uh, a month ago to create a camera bag. Because they yeah. looked at, like, Trey's audience are people who use cameras. Trey is very, very knowledgeable about what makes for good, what makes for bad. They launched a Kickstarter on like, July 1st or some, July something, whatever, like, so a little over a month and a half ago. They are going to raise $100,000 for the, the Everyday Messenger, a bag for cameras and essential carry. Tried to raise hundred grand. they are over $2 million right now. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I don't doubt it. Okay, and that's pretty amazing. So Trey, who's got a huge, huge fan base, a huge group of people who follow him for his photography stuff, teamed up with some people that you know are probably known for creating great products, but maybe don't have that specifically energized fan base like he does. And the two of them work together to create an amazing thing. Justin had a great idea for a project, a great idea for a card game. Justin's drawings, an illustrative capacity. I haven't uh, lived are, up to the potential yet. Ha! I was, I was waiting to see where that was yeah. going to go. <laughs> okay. But Justin plus a team of people who are amazing at it and good at figuring out card play and all that, amazing product. So Trey, great card brand. I mean, great branding, great everything. Teams up with Peak Design and helps promote this thing. And it's a gorgeous camera bag. And, like, you can buy one of these suckers for, you know, what is this? It's like 200 bucks or whatever was the 195 you got one of these bags where it's going to come out at like 250, right? That's huge, man. That's amazing. It, it's got a clip on the side so the camera can plug into it on the edge there. If you're a photographer and you see this thing in this gorgeously produced video, fantastic produced video, you're like, oh, hell, you know, I want to have one of these. You know, that was a huge thing for us was, was trying to figure out what uh, – what our Kickstarter video should look like and, and, and to the level of which it, it, it should, uh, you know, like what, what does a successful card game Kickstarter look like versus a, a successful camera bag video look like, you know, for physical products like that, you, the, the, the bar is extraordinarily high, you know, it is television commercial high. Uh, you you need to hire professionals to make sure that it looks this good. For card games, even successful ones, in general, you can make it a little bit more vloggy. 
But it, it's it's certainly uh, you know something that it, we needed to pay attention to because if card game videos looked like this video that we're watching right now, and you can go ahead and see aerial uh, drone the, shot of a guy climbing a peak in the Golden Gate Bridge in the background. Yeah, you know, uh, it, it 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 would be something that we'd have to do. You know, if you wanted to be successful, you got to at least be in that in that world. You know, in that in that uh, that neighborhood. And now we're getting a big part of that, you know, and, you know, you look at the things they did right in this video, you see the team of people working on this. So you understand like, oh, wow, you know, it's 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 not just a guy in his basement. It's like, I just been waiting for somebody to bet on my dream. Yeah. You know? Well, and, and that that's the thing is uh, a successful campaign oftentimes uh, gives a very clear, very direct message to the backer that says here is your personal benefit to being a part of it. And in the case of. Uh, uh, the contender, it's like, you know, this is you laughing with your friends, having this novel new experience. In the case of this, it's like, this is you carrying your bag and, and being, you know, uh, taking awesome photos of the Well, and it's bridge. also like a video that expensive says, if we spent this much on a video, yeah. your bag's not going to fall apart five days when after you get it. Correct. Correct. You know, I, I, like we, we probably know what quality is. I got it. So in Trey's website on Stuck in Customs, he announced had the announcement for the bag. And so the first comment is B Dog writes, "That bag is nice, but way too to expensive. I backed the smaller bag. Would love the bigger one if it was in the hundred dollar range." Trey writes, "Thanks for your feedback." Next comment from B Dog. Last few days, I mulled it over and decided to pledge for the messenger bag. It's just too beautiful and functional. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Well, I mean, right, so, so Tensor Guy says, so spend on the video. If you have a high margin product, it would harm your ability for people to think that they're going to get a good quality product if your video sucks, if it looks like it was made by your five friends. Because oh. then there is a perception that your five friends are the one making this high margin product. For, so, yeah, for, for a deck of cards, it's a different story. Well, it's, but even still. So, uh, Brian, can you go full screen on me? Uh, yeah. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen, taking the floor. So you want to plan your video. This is not what you want to do. So we're launching a Kickstarter for a pen. <laughs> not just any pen. This is the super pen because this end you can use as a, a touch thing, and it's great, and we hope you like it. Can they hear me? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's funny because there's all those uh, social cues, right? It's social proof is what we oh, there we go. <laughs> Iron Man attacked me. Our <laughs> <laughs> smartest heroes are jerks. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best Kickstarter video ever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still in character, guys. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, as I was saying, and that's like when you get the ones where they do the recording and they're, and they're like, uh, audio and yours, I noticed there was a couple of you guys are way the hell away from the microphone, but it wasn't for the whole thing, you know? Uh, yeah, no, there was a lot of sweetening. Uh, we used a room mic where we probably, if, if we were smarter and could do it again, we would, we would be smarter with audio than we thought because that room was a lot echo, uh, echo -er -er than we thought. Uh, but, 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 you, but you, you showed it being played, you put effort into it. You had some extra, some were more talented than others. Um, you put effort, you put a lot of effort into it. There was a lot of humor and it moved and it did like that. Compare that to like our really cap crappy Patreon video, you know, yes. where it's just us doing like, give us money for Patreon. Yay. You know, uh, way but, better. but the role of those two are far different in my opinion. Kickstarter, yeah. Kickstarter very often is a first impression. Mm -hmm. Kickstarter videos get shared on Facebook, you know, and people back them immediately right. once they uh, see it. Pa I Patreons are a, uh, a collection dish. Uh, the plate's being passed in the middle of church, and now it's your thing like, hey, you've enjoyed the sermon so far. Now's the part where you throw some money in, and uh, which is different. But, yeah, and more specifically, it's like you know who these people are. Like, yeah, like correct. You know, like, and well, you and you've already the been elements of their charm. You've already uh, been partaking in it to begin with. Yeah, like this is... The majority of the people that have given us $73,066 so far don't know who the f word I am, John is, Meg, or Fawn are at all. 
They all think that we are equal strangers. And so anything that I say or John says is representative of the game until we show gameplay. I'm going to ask you a question here, though. Yeah. Um, so what's amazing here is looking at like your at your contribution level, you have almost a thousand backers at the thirty five dollar level, and yeah. then you have almost half as many above. You know, you've got you got fifty four backers at the one hundred fifty level. You got fifty. You got two hundred thirty at at, at fifty five. You've got uh, <coughs> you know, it's interesting. Like almost you know only twenty two went for the the jump from thirty five to fifty five. Almost you know twenty two for forty. But anyhow. You've got a thousand people who you bought a bunch of people. Way more people skipped over the first level, the twenty-five dollar level. Yeah. What percentage do you think these people? And by the video looks really, really good. The video looks really good. What percentage of people do you think know who you are? Knew who you were before? Uh, I think we got to fifteen thousand with people who who knew who I was. Okay. Um, I would say to take a guess, we got probably. 20 to 25,000 for people who know who I am and have heard me on some level. The rest of it has been, uh, has been network effect. How much of that network effect that was motivating people who knew of you, but then saw it in some other means and go, Oh, oh yeah. no, no, no. Yeah. And, and, and in, in that level, I mean, I, I couldn't, I couldn't make a guess, but I, I think that that certainly helps inspiring passion in people that uh, listen to your stuff enough that you feel that there is a trusting relationship that they want to spread the word on something and you're not begging them for it is gigantic. It, 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 it's the only thing that, uh, that I, I think matters in this kind of new weird internet economy thing. Like, like, and it is the, the great benefit of trying to be a good person in public, you know, <laughs> uh, because, if, if 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 they if, if people think that they are part of it and they're not just being taken advantage of, then uh, you know I know that's how I want to be treated. I, I want I want to feel good about the stuff that I give money. And also with Kickstarter, I want to get the thing I pay for, which is very rare. And I guarantee you, everybody will get <laughs> the contender. There's not going to be any crazy like oh you know China like kind of. Uh, production delays you will get it it will not be a problem so spe speaking of which like logistically did you have stuff figured out in advance uh yes. you know like various tiers like well if we make this much we'll go with these guys this much we'll do these guys well no we had all of our stuff sourced you know uh, we're working with the same company that uh, uh does cards against humanity uh ad magic um you know uh we're going to rely on amazon for all fulfillment um they do uh, shipping stuff and it'll allow us to just send a big old pile of stuff to Amazon because they're just going to be our uh, reseller after that. Uh, so we're not going to have to deal with fulfillment except for the larger levels when we're sending buttons and posters and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, we, we had an idea. Really the biggest question now was where our point was where we reinvest. There's certainly a point where we're like, all right, we all got a couple thousand dollars. We made a card game. High five, everybody. Let's drink some rosé. Uh, and then there's the other point where it's like, we do we have a business? Because we should probably put money back into the business to continue to produce stuff, especially through the end of the 2016 election. Dude, and that's that, actually those a really are the good, numbers that we're hitting now. Yeah, no, uh, uh, that's actually a really good point because that's the the most people most people don't begin with the possibility of success in their mind. Well, they, they begin with a minimum viable product. They're like, oh, well, if we hit this, we'll, you know, cross the line and then we could do the thing. But then, uh, but then you suddenly realize, oh crap, we're in charge of, we, we have a brand now and this is an ongoing thing. And people didn't suddenly stop liking it just because we crossed this arbitrary goal that we started with. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and that is where a lot of the people that I'm, I'm working with, you know, are just invaluable. John is a tremendous numbers guy. Uh, uh, Megan Fawn are, are both, uh, you know, business, small business owners. They run their own design firm that they have to deal with the, the realities of, you know, money coming in and money going out. Uh, I am the most irresponsible of us and I am conscious enough about these issues that uh, I am not a hindrance, hopefully. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's, Thankful that I, I have those kind of partners. If, I, if I'm the weak link in the like, let's dream big and be careful about it and, and, and make sure that we're doing it responsibly, then I think we got a pretty good team.
Right on. Where was the pick? When did they? How did Kickstarter select you? And what was it? An email they sent out, or? Yeah, somebody just put it in the in the chat room a little bit ago. Uh, but yeah, it was an email of projects we love, uh, and yeah, it was like shaping your world. Uh, we were also a Kickstarter staff pick, but apparently, we heard rumors that uh, they frown upon people putting that in their picture. And that people who are Kickstarter staff picks, um, you know, very often get delisted if they put it on their picture. I don't know if that's true or not, uh, but we decided to play it safe and and take off the like Kickstarter staff pick thing. Hmm. Oh, I'm trying to find. <clears throat> I don't know if I got that email from them. Do you know when that came out? Uh, I believe they stagger it. Because people were, were reporting that they were getting it over a period of two days. What I mean, what would am I talking Yesterday a week ago? The day weeks ago? What's that? Yesterday and the day before. Okay, cool. All right. Because I'm curious to see, uh, and I wonder if they, I guess maybe they target them too. Because I'd love to compare to you to the other ones to see how well did the other ones benefit. What? Because I'm looking at some of these ones that that have been funded. You know that just did not get the jump that you got. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, I, I I really cannot say uh, 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 enough in all in all due uh, humility. Um, I believe we we have a tremendous opening pitch. Cards Against Humanity for politics is just something that is sticky, is prescient, is of the moment. <laughs> Uh, I, don't and, and is, I don't see it happening, Justin. I don't think it's going to work. Ha! So, I mean, I, I think that's that's huge. And, and it, it's why just the more attention we get, the more, you know, that we, that we get people to, to, to put it in. So it wouldn't shock me people who got the same uh, the same uh, sunshine we did didn't make as much hay. Uh, because, you know, if you look at the other two uh things that are on that email that, that we have made more than uh, they, they both have more esoteric ideas. <laughs> mm -hmm. hmm. So you're saying we got to do a weird things one. Got it. Ha. Uh, dude. Like, so here's our here. Here's, here's pulling back the curtain and we can, we can kind of wind down on this because I do have to take a shower and fly to Austin. Um, <laughs> I have, dear After Things listener, grown up, uh, you know, in my life emotionally and, and in business wise as uh, with a very independent mindset that you can make your dreams a reality inside your own ears. And the two, two of the biggest examples are the other people on this podcast, Andrew and Brian. Uh, part of what I have tried to do over the past couple of years has been to just create uh, uh, something that people can latch on to. You know, I have this very deep-seated religious belief that there is a benefit to this new media thing and that the connections that we make on this show and every other uh, is important and that can lead me to an independent financial uh, situation. But what I've learned and been very careful of is with Brian and Andrew, and as Andrew was pointing out before, he can't come out with a diet you know, a, a diet thing, or he can't come out with a, uh, a, a thigh master because that's not what people want to buy. It's not what it, people who give a shit about Andrew want to buy from Andrew. Uh, Brian has created a small burgeoning growing empire in scam stuff. And part of what you've done with that is realizing exactly what people want to buy from scam stuff, because you could have gone the, the root of any other magic retailer and just bought the hot magic tricks via a wholesaler and sold it at, uh, you know, online retail and, and just kind of done that. And that would have been X amount of successful. You have been more successful in my opinion, because you have understood, Whoa, hold on. People really want this kind of lifestyle, uh, you know, maybe fudging the edge of, uh, you know, safe or, 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 you know, nice to have, you know, semi dangerous kind of, uh, uh, products. You have stayed exactly within the brand and your lane 
and done very well for it. Well, and, and this sort of takes us full circle back to the, uh, the Star Wars thing, because like uh, the toughest part of the job, uh, you know, if, if scam stuff is a, any kind of success, it's, it's because of our curation and curation means saying no. <laughs> And it's like, that's the hard part of the job is saying, no, that's not good enough. That's too dorky. That's too geeky. That's something I would picture a three-year-old doing. And, uh, uh, but saying no, you know, strengthens the voice and so on. But yeah, uh, that's, that's kind of you to say. Well, and, and Andrew, like I watched products do well with Andrew when we, when, you know, selling it on, on, on the website for magic effects, I, I've seen projects do well. I've seen projects not do so well. I've seen, you know, what the difference is and, 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 and us understanding what people want to buy and what they want and, and what they don't. And ultimately what we found with Andrew's products is that the greatest brand value was his brain and, and, and his ingenuity that, that, you know, you buy an Andrew main product, what you, what you are going to do is bridge the gap between what you have. You can maybe build it with, with, uh, you know, you don't need to, you know, spend hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars to build something. We will bridge the gap for you with ingenuity. You know, that is the product that we are selling is that Andrew is a, is a great mind for this. And, and you can bridge the, the money gap with ingenuity. Those are the things that did extraordinarily well uh, for us. And so for me, the, the, the question has always been, if I'm going to sell a physical product, what is it? And I kind of had it in the back of my head for the last couple of years that card games were kind of, were, were, were possibly it because it, they are so creator dependent lately in the last five, 10 years. Um, they are very personality driven and they are small price margin. Like you're not going to spend more than, you know, for you're getting collector's editions for 55 in general, you can probably buy it for 25, something like that. Um, and that fits the audience I talk to what the audience that I talk to likes about me. And, uh, I'm, I'm glad you see it's paid off, but it's something that I've thought about quite a bit. You know, it's interesting. I'm looking at exploding kittens, and it's you know you hear the number, you know they made eight point seven million. Are they? I mean, it's the project has got that obviously. Yeah. That's their costs. Uh, Two hundred and nineteen thousand backers. Two hundred and nineteen thousand backers. The bulk of them, two hundred thousand, the NSFW deck, which. Listen, guys, don't litigate, but yeah, um, and that's an amazing bro. thing. What's that? Yeah, no, the NSFW deck. Yeah, I mean, and that's that's a a you know this is the biggest. There's only been two million dollar decks that I found so far thumbing through here on Kickstarter. Uh, this in Hex MMO, uh, but you know the and and it's it's certainly fascinating to see that like in in breaking down you know the, you you have. Exploding Kittens was a great mix of several people who already had huge online bases, you know, at Elon Lee, The Oatmeal, Shane Small. And so, you know, between the three of those people tying together, everybody like, you like our brand? Look what happens. We put this together. You know, it, that's an amazing thing. So I think going forward is uh, you, you, you chose wisely, sir. You planned things wisely. You did a very good job. And I'm just very beaming with, with pride over, you know, what you've done there, knowing you. Uh, well, you know, listen, it's, it's, it's all part of the plan. It's all part of the plan. You uh, are in the top 36 of all time Kickstarter card games, I think, as far as, uh, uh, raising money. Oh crap. Are we? Where's that list? That's something else for me to obsess I typed weirdly kick, over. I typed card games into Kickstarter and I started counting. So <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. I mean, like the top fifty or sixty. But anyhow, sure. I would, yeah. I would, I would be shocked if we were in the top forty. That'd be crazy. Uh, I think you're you're pretty close to getting to there, though. Because if you look at like uh, your, you would be surprised. Um, maybe you wouldn't. I don't know. But anyhow, a very good lesson. So. Part of what I've taken away from this is have your product 
as fully formed as you possibly can. Take it as far uh, as yeah. you can until you need, you know, you're, you're ready to go. Like, all we need now is just the money to make this thing happen. You know, don't go half-assed. Don't bring half-assed there. Well, and, and you know, the thing for me is, like, be in touch with what you want as a consumer. I back a lot of crap on Kickstarter. And there is some stuff that I am very frustrated with. Coin, for example. Let me take a gigantic oh, dump definitely, on Coin. Definitely, definitely backed Coin. Backed Coin. Regret it. Uh, I've got nothing. I am, uh, you know, technology has now effectively lapped its usefulness. I would still like it because I paid for it. Uh, it. That has been a complete breach of trust. And now everybody that is involved in it, including the, the video production company that did the awesome commercial for which I love so much that I gave it $200, uh, is, is just uh, completely persona non grata for me. Uh, I, I, I just I can't deal with them. Uh, and, and that frustration has very much informed that we want to like it is a personal mission to get them, get anybody who buys this, their cards ASAP. Yeah, yeah I look at I look at uh, some of the stuff, some of the technology things that I funded, um, you know, like uh that were supposed to be delivered like last year, like Air V, you know, like we remember we backed Air VR. Yep. Which, uh, well, that was estimated delivery. Yeah, mine was December 2014. I already bought a thing that does this thing on Amazon for 20 bucks, you know? Yeah. Um, and then it's, you look at their updates, and their last update was May 20, May, you know? And so May. June, July, August, September, August, you know, we're three months behind, quarter, you know, a whole quarter behind, and there's been no update about where that thing is. And and I get it. These things fall behind. These things sometimes aren't where you, you know, would like them to be. But when you shut in, part of what happens is you get a lot of infighting within the people. There's a lot of shared responsibility than a lot of ducking responsibility, and nobody wants to step forward and say this is what it is and be the person that's the public brunt of that. Uh, but it's it can be frustrating, you know. And yeah, no, it 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 sucks, and and it's it's something that I very much don't want to be a part of, and 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 it's it's the reason why we were so close. I mean, again, we were close to not doing Kickstarter. That's how close we were to just printing these things. Uh, and, and we decided to do Kickstarter because it would be better for the project and we'd be able to get more cards in every base deck if we just had a gigantic pile of money up front that we wouldn't have to have people buy add-ons to it. We could just give more crap in the main deck if we just had a big pile of money um, up front. So, oh, and, and don't even get me started, but yeah, no, uh, uh, Waffle Avogus says to Brian, the, the, you know, all the video games by big, gigantic names that have been total letdowns. I mean, that's a goddamn haunted house of, of you know, uh, of, of, of people that have just raised ridiculous sums of money that have been completely squandered, including, I mean, like, like you know, we're, we're friends with, with Terpster at, at Yogscast. They had a whole game that they raised a gigantic amount of money on, and it just went away because they couldn't, you know, you know they, they, they were at a different phase of development than I think they would have wanted to if they could do it over again. They would want to have a game close to done and then raise money for it as opposed to raising money to develop a game when you can't trust these developers. Yep. He and kept his mouth. I gotta go because I gotta. I gotta get to the airport. Go. Oh. Bye. All right, dude. Hate it when, that was hate awesome. It lingers like that, Brian. It's really awkward and weird. Congratulations, and, weird. and uh, uh, everybody, head on over to the Contender US and uh, tune in later on for me and Justin to goof around. Uh, Andrew, how's it been? It's been good. Been a lot of traveling. I went out to Joshua Tree to go look at the stars. That's star. right, Andrew. It's been after. Bye. Uh, cool beans. Uh, yeah, anybody, if you are a night owl slash you don't work on Mondays, then you better get hold on to your butts because Brian and Justin, after dark or not, I don't know. We'll talk to you. Right on. Um, uh, peace out, gang. All right. I'm shutting everything down. Bye, everybody.